you're on the precipice of an artificial super intelligence revolution that will alter your day-to-day -day life in ways that none of us can quite imagine. But no matter how much human creativity is unlocked by AI or how disruptive it will be to the traditional economy, no change would be as dramatic as unlocking immortality. Today's guest believes the rate of progress in AI means our only goal should be to stay alive long enough for AI to take over. He believes that algorithms may hold the key to living forever. Here we go for round three with Brian Johnson. Do you think that we as a species should hand over our decision-making process entirely to AI when it's ready? Yeah, I think we, we need a new form of cognition for ourselves and paired with AI for the species. And uh, if you look at Homo sapiens as an independent source of intelligence, we're pretty good at some things, we're terrible at other things. And the things we're terrible at and include our, our willingness to engage in self-destructive behaviors or planetary destruction or even destroying each other instead of trying to build something uh, that is much superior than our own uh, self-interests. And so currently, we are the best form of intelligence on this planet, but we need to evolve to something superior. So I've tried to demonstrate with Blueprint that yes, I think that as a opening conversation, we should be mindful that it may be the time that we graduate to a new form of intelligence. Okay, those sound slightly different to me. So what I took away from a ton of research on you is that basically we, to your point, we know that we can't think through these problems well. We know that we're on the cusp of artificial intelligence that is almost certainly gonna be way more powerful than us, unlike anything that we could yeah. ever imagine that immortality becomes just one of the problems that we'll never solve for ourselves, but AI could potentially solve for us. I think you've even said evolution gave us man and man will create God. Yeah. So if we're taking that lens on AI, are we as humans evolving into something or have we created the thing that you would, for our own benefit, I think is how you see it, want to sign over our yeah. decision-making process too. So I think your question is correct. I'm saying that if we lay out, let's say that we do 10,000 things as individuals in that we seek out food, we seek out shelter, we seek out love, we try to solve problems, we learn, we, we list out all the things we do as humans. And then, then you start applying computational intelligence to each one of these things and say, can an algorithm do this better than we can? You know, can it do, uh, can it, perform mathematical computations better than humans. Yes, it can. You know, much better than we can in our heads, much better we can on paper. It's faster, it's better. And then if you size up and say, of the things that AI can do better than humans now, what remains, we humans are better than AI, what is the time frame of which is going to close that gap? So that's one way to look at it. And it's reasonable to say in any one of those functions, AI is probably going to be better at every single one of us on every single one of those functions it's hard to short that bet. And then if you say, okay, so what things might be imminent? And what I was trying to pro prove with Blueprint is one of the most sacred things about being human, which is my autonomy and free will to make decisions about what I'm in the mood for or what I want to do, my preference in any given moment. And I started with health and wellness. So I said, can an algorithm decide what I eat? Can an algorithm decide when I go to bed? Can an algorithm decide what exercise protocol I should do? And I ceded control and I said, yes, I'm going to let the AI do this and I'm going to believe or trust in this process and I'm going to see the results. Like, can I actually be better at being me than I can myself? And three years in, the answer is yes, that I would much rather have an algorithm take care of my health and wellness than I would myself. I am prone to self-destructive behavior. And so I look at the bigger model and I say, it seems like the most obvious conclusion I could make in looking at the world right now that algorithms are going to be superior superior to us in all in all things. Therefore, uh, it would be much more constructive for me to adopt this framework and build with it rather than try to resist it. Okay, so uh, having had the privilege of reading your book, Don't Die, I know where some of this goes. So I, I know that your punchline is people need to have that aha moment for themselves, yeah. but I'd love to walk through what those building blocks are because 
I, I am way pro AI. Like I could not be more excited about a future with AI. Uh, however, I'm equally paranoid that this all goes wrong. I have a huge problem with authority. So I have yeah. just terrifying fears of authoritarianism, which yeah. I feel knocking at the door right now uh, for us, certainly in the West. So my initial reaction to this is, hey, I yeah. love being able to opt out. I love being able to use algorithms that may have insights, but I want to be definitively in control yeah. of whether I do or don't um, engage with this. And one of the, the sort of playful questions that you will ask people is, if you couldn't opt out of the AI, mm -hmm. would it still make sense to do it? So if we couldn't opt out of the AI, would you still want us to do it? Yes because probabilistically, I think it increases our chance of uh, survival. And so what I'm really saying is that what I find is in conversation, most people will find, call it five to 10 good arguments on why what I'm saying shouldn't be considered. You know, why it, it immediately steps into authoritarianism or it steps into some kind of dystopic environment or blank, blank, blank. And I concede that they're reasonable contemplations. And my framework is I remove myself from the, f the next few years and even the next few decades. And I say, I'm only going to look at our moment from the perspective of the 25th century. That's the only thing that gives me clarity. Because if you are trying to extract wisdom in the moment of this noise, it's almost impossible. And you hear basically an infinite number of opinions that all logjam the situation. And so I guess when I say, when I look at it from that perspective, I can say, well, okay, on a few hundred year time scale, I'm going to think it's reasonable to say that algorithms are going to get better at a rate than our native abilities. That uh, that speed of improvement is probably going to even outstrip our paired abilities. Like I don't think I'm going to get a, a, you know, a chip in my brain that is going to make me a super intelligent species. So it may augment a few things here and there, but it's not going to rival... Um, a computational system with millions of servers. It's just not going to do it. So I'm not going to become that super AI myself. I'm going to live in this larger framework of intelligence. And so if I say, if that's the case and we're heading down this trajectory right now, we need to think about it from that kind of multi-hundred year time scale if we want to survive ourselves. And that's really the point I'm trying to make. And if you, if you take that frame, it opens up the mind because like you're saying, and you make good points, is there's so many ways to kill this idea. Right, so I'm basically saying um, an algorithm takes better care of me than I can myself. We are facing multiple existential crises as a species. We're on we're on the eve of the creation of baby. Uh, we're on the eve of creating superintelligence. What do we do as a species? I'm asking that question in the most sober form possible. If we create superintelligence and we drop it into the games we play right now with, as humans, we're going to say, okay, are we going to become better at war? Are we going to use it to make more money? Are we going to use it to get more social media followers? Like, How do we use our new superintelligence? And I'm saying if you take the superintelligence and put it into current games that homo sapiens play, we increase the likelihood we're going to kill ourselves. And so we have to basically look at this from a new perspective. And what I'm suggesting is as we create superintelligence, the, the new game of existence is eliminating all sources of death for humans and the planet. That we try to eliminate death for us individually, we eliminate sources of death for the planet, we eliminate sources of death in, at all causes and across every function of society. That's the new game we play as superintelligence. Okay, so let me give people a mile marker. So you and I did an episode about a year ago where you walked us through what the blueprint for health is, you striving for immortality. You've been on my radar for years and years but recently you've really rocketed to prominence because what you've done to demonstrate that we may be able to slow aging, possibly reverse aging, has caught the attention of a lot of people. Some people think it's stupid. Other people are so inspired they're completely embracing it. But the idea was, and correct me if I go wrong anywhere here, um, but this will help people understand your point about seeding control to an AI. Uh, you say, I made up of trillions of cells. 
Um, me being an authoritarian overlord does not work well because I eat ice cream, I eat late, right. I'm 60 pounds heavier than you are now, certainly a lot less muscle mass, losing my hair, going gray, like yeah. all the things people would not want to do. People need to only look at the photos of where you started. Uh, I'm going to use the democratic model and I'm going to let my cells speak up. Yes. And so the AI is just reading the will of the people, as it were, That's the right. will of the cells. And it's saying, ooh, for your liver to be happy, you need to eat this extract right now. Yeah. Uh, for your heart to be healthy, you need to go run on the treadmill, on and on and on. Yeah. You were the most measured man in history. Uh, we will certainly get into the measurements of your penis, which is amazing. It's utterly fascinating. Uh, but that's what's driving this. So you, as you said, you've been doing this for three years. You've seen the results in just your physicality, um, quality of your mental state yeah. because you're getting perfect sleep scores and all that stuff. Okay, so now if people hold that in their mind, this is somebody who's run the very first leg of this test of yeah. can algorithms actually make my life better? And that begins driving the thinking. Um, why do you think, because you've held a bunch of, um, to use a nice fancy word, salons where you invite people to your house and you throw this idea, would you give yourself over to the algorithm? Mm -hmm. And you said it, people go through this very predictable course of yeah. no, basically, yeah. and they have a reaction. If it would make our lives better, why do we push back? Yeah. People push back for, uh, reasons that are 99% common. They perceive that their autonomy is better than happiness. So the, the beginning of the, of the question is you get the best physical, mental, spiritual health of your life, like the best. You've never felt better in your entire life. And people are willing to give that up so that they can maintain autonomy for some unknown reason. It's basically, the autonomy is going to make them more miserable, but they'd rather be miserable and have autonomy than the best of their, of their life. But they just can't let go of control of autonomy. And usually behind the autonomy, it's a few perceptions. One is it's, I can't have my vices anymore. I'm not going to be able to make that, you know, spur of the moment decision to eat the cookie or the ice cream or whatever. Or you may miss out on social norms you want to participate in. You, you think I can no longer go out with friends or I can no longer do this thing. But they're viewing it from a, a framework of loss. And that loss aversion is so significant that they don't care they're giving up the best version of their existence. And so that's like a, a first set of commons. And then others is just deep distrust. There's good reasons why people in society distrust organizations, distrust others. So it's a deep distrust. And so I understand why people say no, because it's rational and reasonable. Uh, the, the larger context is that if there's a loss aversion to this thing, on the flip side to those who are open to gain, if you're... If you live, you know, a few thousand, you know, a few thousand years ago, let's say you're Alexander the Great, what's the most ambitious thing you can do in that moment? Or one of the most ambitious things you can do? You can raise an army, conquer territory, and establish an empire. If you fast forward a few hundred years, uh, maybe you can start playing with mathematics. Maybe you can start playing with poetry. You know, like society has progressed, and in any given age, you can kind of, in your time and place, express the most ambitious thing possible. And so the question in 2024 is, what is peak expression of ambition? Like the absolute max, you know, in Magellan, it was sailing around the world in the, in the 1500s. And Armstrong is going to the, to the moon. So in 2024, what is it? And so it used to be that there's, five, there's three levels of ambition. Uh, start a company, start a country, start a religion. You know, and those are on time scales because you build a company and may do well for a certain time, but then it goes out of business and you, it kind of fades. Countries have usually have longer durations than countries, and uh, religions usually outlast them all, maybe thousands of years. Now there's a four and five. So now you'd say number four is don't die. Number five is homo deus or become a god. And so that's you know number four and number five are things that people have always dreamed of doing all throughout history but it's never been practical. You've always had to make up stories like, in this religion, if you obey these rules, you get this afterlife where this amazing thing happens, or I'm going to go to the jungle and drink this elixir because of whatever. It's been in the imaginations, but it's never been practical. And so what I'm suggesting is, this thought experiment teases out where we're at in time and place, but I'm suggesting as a species, we have not yet internalized 
the ambition right before us. We don't understand that death can be conquered. It is a reasonable thing to say that's possible. And if you do that, then the idea of becoming some kind of expansive, omnipotent kind of intelligence, we don't know what the limitation is. And so it's an interesting goal. And that's what I'm trying to do is hit at this from why we're scared and then also trying to flip around and say, here's the opportunity, which we don't really know exists yet. All right. This is another, I think, really important mile marker for people. Uh, and that mile marker would be we're at a pivotal moment in history. And once you put you and everything you're saying into the context of before, that this would not have made any sense. Living the blueprint life, making all these sacrifices, right. leaning into aestheticism where you're just not doing all the fun stuff that people think of drugs, drinking, party. Um, you're not going to do that stuff because if you forsake it in this very unique moment in time, you can cross a chasm to super intelligence and we have faith that the yeah. super intelligence will solve these problems. Yes. Okay, that's the first half of this mile marker. The second half is this idea of the only people you're trying to impress live in the year 2400, the 25th century. Yeah. And you're making the assumption that this really is the pivotal moment that we think it is, that, that it is a moment upon which history turns. And how we handle this moment is going to determine whether the future looks back on us as the people that messed up this moment, mm -hmm. or they look back on us as the people that that really laid the groundwork so that this new um, AI-fueled, hopefully amazing future can actually come into existence. Well said. Okay, so uh, therein lies the framework. What will people in 2500 respect about us in this moment? What do we need to pull off? They will say, we are eternally grateful that Homo sapiens in the early 21st century, when they first saw sparks of superintelligence, they were wise enough to realize that the games they were playing, which was primarily capitalism, of how much money you could make, the status you could achieve, the power you could acquire, territory, conflict, they acquired the wisdom to see past their moment in time, and they said, we are going to direct every bit of societal energy, individually and collectively, and conquer death. That means, uh, individually, we're not going to kill each other, we're not going to kill the planet, and we're going to take this superintelligence and align it for the sole objective of eliminating death across all of society. That, that was the rallying cry. And so what, was, what, what they did, this is the 25th century, what they did that was interesting is they were so clever. They saw that Don't Die was the, the most played game on planet Earth, that they had all these fractions of different religions and nation states and ethnic, you know, ethnic groups and gender. They were at war with each other over every conceivable divide you could imagine, and they just fought nonstop. And they were able to unify themselves and say, you know what? We're all playing the don't die game every second of every day. It's the most played game in, in that time and place, even more so than capitalism. And they were wise enough to wake up and say, you know what? This is the moment we join together on the one thing we all agree upon. Let's sort this thing out. And they did that. And now intelligence is thriving throughout the galaxy because they were at that critical point where intelligence went on this you know, exponential curve of growth throughout the, the solar system. Do you think that compassion is innate to intelligence? I hope. But do you have any reason to believe that's true? No, no reason whatsoever. Yeah, that's what scares me. So I love your thesis. I want your thesis to be true. And yet, when I think about what humans are really mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. we, we play Don't Die. There is no doubt, but you and I are both history buffs. And so we know that there are these horrifying spikes of kill and conquer. Yes. And that that is native to the human mind. It seems to me the battle that don't die is up against. Uh, and I don't know if you like the idea of categorizing don't die as a new religion, but I will very much say that's what it looks like from the outside. Um, so you've got this new religion. Here's what you're going to be up against. The human mind has a tremendous capacity for compassion. And so I get what you're trying to tap mm -hmm. into and what you want people to breathe life into. But we are also hyper-tribal 
that was necessary to survive, mm -hmm. to get us here. We have these, what I call evolutionary algorithms that are implanted in our brains that make us the way that we are, that make us desire autonomy, that make us desire the dopamine feedback loop that social media takes so much advantage of, that yeah. uh, Oreos take advantage of, the, the whole uh, big agriculture uh, industrial complex takes advantage of. Kill and conquer, you've got the um, military industrial complex taking advantage mm -hmm. of it. But all of them are riding on the back of a thing that already exists in our mind. Mm -hmm. And so you've talked about don't die as being like, hey, this might be the one, you don't say religion, I'm gonna use that word anytime by all means tell me to stop, but uh, that we are living in a time where this religion, instead of taking a thousand years to catch on, that this could take off, this could have that mm -hmm. rapid acceleration. If you set aside super intelligence forcing us to adopt it or inspiring us to adopt yeah, it, right. either way, right. but if you take that off the table, I don't see the signs that we will do that naturally. Right. Do you? <laughs> yeah. It, um, this is why I tried to be the example myself. I approached this and I said, I'm not a holy being, you know, like somehow above the primal instincts that we all have. So I know if I have in my house bad food, I'm probably going to eat it. And I know if I put myself in certain situations, I'm probably going to make bad decisions. And so this is why I said I'm going to willingly build an algorithm that takes better care of me than I can myself. And so then when I squawk inside and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. I'm bound by the algorithm. I mean, this is a story as old as, you know, Ulysses being tied to the mask, right? Like he knew he wanted to hear the siren song, but he told his mates to tie him to the mask so that when they when he could hear it, he couldn't say anything. He put he put wax in their ears so that he, they couldn't hear him uh, say, say give the command to release him. And so I was doing the same thing. And so um, I concur with what you're saying. The idea that humanity is going to cheerfully walk into this scenario, it's hard to see. Now, having said that, sometimes these things... Uh, the principles I'm talking about arrive in benign ways. So Ozempic, Ozempic is an example of an algorithm that takes better care of you than you can yourself. So Ozempic works really well for weight loss. Now it has a whole bunch of side effects. It's not an ideal drug. Like it's very complicated. That said, people, it, it's, it almost can't be bought. It's in that high of demand because you take it and it just turns off these bad parts of your brain and allows you to lose weight and become the person you want to become. Being able to communicate effectively is critically important. Whether you're a manager, a CEO, an entrepreneur, Grammarly can help you have a greater impact at work with better and faster everyday communication. Grammarly is an AI writing partner that's trusted by tens of millions of professionals and 96% of them report that Grammarly helps them craft more impactful writing. From ideating on video titles or product names to summarizing long documents and replying to client emails better and faster than ever before. All of these AI features are for free and they work where you work, it literally works across over 500,000 apps and websites. Make your point and have a greater impact with Grammarly. Sign up now and download Grammarly for free at grammarly.com slash impact theory. That's grammarly.com slash impact theory. And so in that regard, people are willing to take an algorithm that does something for them they can't do themselves to achieve an outcome they want. And so it doesn't have to be a top-down control scenario. It could just be very benign ways where we find where algorithms actually help us achieve the things we already care about. And we willfully do these things. Now, for me, I wanted to see if I could get to age escape velocity. So it was a goal I wanted to say, so I'm willing to make that trade-off. So I think you can take what you said, you can adjust it just a little bit and see all the examples in life where we, all of us, already willfully partake of the situation. And so we run our mouths and say how scared we are or how we're never going to do it. Is this dystopic? Meanwhile, we're, all, we're already already doing it in so many ways. So I think it can actually, it can work itself out. We need to be thoughtful that this is the case. I don't think we would want to walk into the future blind about what we're doing. I think it's worthwhile having this discussion and for everyone to say, let me tell you all the reasons why I hate it. 
we can cycle through it together and then we can think through how we might execute. Okay, so uh, the big problem for me is alignment. So for yeah. people that aren't familiar with the idea of AI alignment, um, one, I will point people to Elon Musk is now suing Sam Altman, uh, who founded OpenAI. Elon went on just a absolute world tour trying to convince world leaders, including the US Congress and Senate, please slow AI down. Nobody would listen to him. And so finally he developed a fatalistic viewpoint and his way forward was, let's develop an AI company that's open so at least everybody has access to the same thing so that it can't be leveraged against people. Sam Altman then turns it into a for-profit company, closes it so people can't see how it's working. They don't have access to it. Elon's now suing him. Uh, what do you take away from that? And then what do you think about the, the alignment problem? How should people think about it? There's so many layers to that situation. Um, OpenAI is the most powerful and most successful AI company in the world. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, Elon's com be, uh, building a competing AI product. Uh, there's, if, you, if you peel it back just from the headlines, there's so much happening behind the scenes that's not not part of the why they told story. So it's more nuanced, it's more complex. There's another element where humans are gonna be humans and they're going to play the Game of Thrones game. That's also there. Uh, there's also a legitimate conversation on how we use these AI systems. And are they open? Are they closed? Do governments regulate? Uh, does the US position itself differently relative to China? So it's this layered, complicated, nuanced topic that I think is very difficult to speak coherently to because there's so many competing interests. And in this moment, uh, you know, I or anyone else could probably say a hundred things about the situation. And it's why I go back out to 25th century to say, how could I try to sober myself up to say anything meaningful about this moment? And so these systems are going to feed into how humanity currently does what it does. We go to war, we have violence, we go for domination, we try for power. And I'm trying to suggest that we need to go after a zeitgeist shift, a zeitgeist, like a cultural shift that is unimaginable to us right now. Like right now, if I say to you, we're going to point all our attention on trying to solve all things that cause death for us collectively, that's unimaginable. And you put forward one argument. You said, that's dystopic, <laughs> whatever. Uh, it's also just pra practically, what does that even mean? Are people going to do it? And I don't think in our current mindset that's going to happen. What I am suggesting is if you look at COVID, how the world behaved in response to COVID was also unthinkable that the entire world would shut down within weeks over a virus. The entire world rebuilt itself around one thing within a few weeks. And what I'm hypothesizing is that AI progress is going to move along at a certain speed, and there will be certain demonstrations and certain realities that introduce existential crisis for the human race. It will maybe call into question uh, who do we trust uh, with news? Yeah, welcome to 2024. Yeah, who do we trust? Who is uh, who in the government is in charge of what? Uh, who is in charge of knowledge? Who is in charge of identity verification? Who is in charge of, you know, like you take all these basic functions of society and you now have this new question, who's actually in charge and who do we trust? that starts breaking down all these layers of society that has, kept, that has kept things relatively stable and predictable. And when that happens, we're just freestyling as a species again. And we kind of have to rebuild from scratch and say, okay, what are these basic sturdy building blocks of society on how we keep law and order, of how we keep trust, of how we actually build. And so we're going to, we're going to have experience decades or centuries equivalent of change in the coming years. Now, someone may say, like, I'm being too ambitious on AI, AI is not real, fine. Say it's 10 years, say it's 20, like whatever. Like take whatever time frame you want. For all intents and purposes, if you're thinking about it from a 25th perspective, 
It's right now. It doesn't matter if it's one year or five or 10 or 20 or 50. It's all right now. It's about the future of the species. And it's about this contemplation of we're probably not going to make it through this moment if we, uh, if we can't figure out how to not to annihilate ourselves. When you say that we might annihilate ourselves, what odds are you giving that? Like, do you feel that we are on the precipice where there is a meaningful percentage chance that we actually don't make it through this moment, which I want you to define? Like, you worried about climate change the most? Are you worried about AI the most? You worried about war? Yeah. You know, an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs. And so we have that kind of risk. We have solar flares as problems. We have, um, like, we have all kinds of existential risks that are outside of our control or, or less so. Then we have the ones that are in our control. So will we use weapons of mass destruction? Um, will we point AI uh, uh, to cause you know, unmitigated harm? Will AI crisis happen because it just runs away out of our control? Um, will, cli- will our climate change so much that the earth becomes so difficult to live here that our our supply chains break down and we come back we we crawl back to be hunter and gatherers like we saw that when the supply chains for uh, broke down with covid society kind of broke down you couldn't get computers you couldn't get you know, companies couldn't get their supplies and the world just kind of broke down from one little virus and now you've got this complicated situation where the climate is making food supplies challenging and transport and rivers dry up and like all the things we're seeing uh, it might render us basically neutered to operate as a species in some kind of effective way, which renders us kind of powerless. And so what I'm saying is we, yes, the situation is pretty serious. And we've done pretty well. We've had nukes for a couple of decades. And, and you know, gratefully, we, we've only used it twice. Sad, you know, sadly, we used it, but um, only a limited number, uh, you know, two times. And so what I'm saying is um, if we're having breakfast and a tsunami is on its way. What we have for breakfast kind of matters, but kind of doesn't. Like we've got a bigger problem to handle. And what I'm suggesting in this moment is the situation at our right in front of us is sufficiently serious that we should be reallocating all of our attention to figure out how we make this thing through. This is not a normal day. And um, so like when you bring up, you know, like there's drama between this and that company, sure, um, fine. Like it's, it's, it's a drama that people understand. It's a drama people want to comment on. It's good fun. It, um, it does redirect our attention away from this bigger problem that I'm trying to address. Okay. In your book, so I won't feel bad pushing you on this. In your book, one of the characters says, uh, a number will do. We can debate later. I want to get a sense of what, yeah. what in fact, <laughs> that same character goes on to say, like, we have to be able to agree what the stakes are. And so this is where Sam Harris, who I love and think is amazing, he believes I don't understand his thinking. He has very great, graciously agreed to come back on the show, which I can't wait for. Um, I think I do understand his thinking. And I think the disconnect is I don't believe that Trump, in this case, is an existential threat, meaning that we are at risk of human, the human race ending. Um, so because we disagree on the stakes, we disagree on all the follow-on to-do items. Yeah. Now, what I'm trying to understand is, at the very beginning of this interview, you said, yes, we should, when AI, when AI is ready, we should give our decision-making over to that entity. Yeah. And I'm saying, okay, are you saying that because you actually believe this unique moment in time is existential in nature? Or is this just, well, there's always asteroids, there's always those things. Is this moment uniquely dangerous? Yes, there's an element of danger. More importantly, we are still the architects of intelligence. We're still, we are the ones building AI. We are pointing it to do certain things. We're training it to become good at certain things. We're giving it feedback. We're giving birth to super intelligence. That is more omnipresent on my mind than anything. And what I'm saying is the way in which we give birth, like the way we raise superintelligence is the most critical thing. Because I think on the timescales that we're talking about, I don't think whether I'm going to live to the year 200 or 120, you know, be 120 years old or 200 years old, I think that this will be brought to a head in the next few years, five, 10 years. I think it's imminent. Now, if I'm wrong, 
like we have more time, great. But it's something that when you're gambling the future of intelligent existence, and we don't know if it's happened before in the galaxy. We haven't found any evidence of it. Maybe it's out there, maybe it's not, we don't know. We are so fortunate to have it on this planet. And we as a species are, we are willing to gamble our existence. And it's a representation that you know, death has always been inevitable. And when death is inevitable, you kind of don't care. Like you're willing to just say, fine, like it's going to end for everyone, so why not? When death becomes inevitable, or when death becomes a maybe, and maybe we can extend our lives, it's a different reframe on how much we value consciousness. And so what I'm saying is if we could shift our framework, and this is what I've been trying to do with Blueprint, I'm trying to say, I've been trying to say death may not be inevitable. And if it may not be inevitable, that may give us something to aspire to so that we want to solve these imminent problems in front of us. But that hasn't been a clean thing because when I say death may not be inevitable, people will say, I don't want to live forever. I never said forever. I just said, I, I don't want to die because people will say, then I, uh, I'm going to get bored or, you know, like they come up with all these reasons. And so this, um, this is why, back to your first question, you know, do I think algorithms, should we as a species begin adopting these algorithms? In many ways, yes, because as a species, our intelligence is pretty limited in acting in our own best interest from the small things like binge eating to the big things like discounting the future that we've never even experienced. It's, it's idiotic to say, I don't want to live some duration of time. We have no idea what it's going to be like. We've never been in this situation before. So for any human to foreclose that opportunity is beyond foolish, but yet we do it. And we just want to, for, we stop that thought process and we stop the conversation and then you kill the will to live. It's, it's a really weird attribute of our own intelligence. So like we have all these weird things that were both brilliant and were idiotic. And it's very hard to tease out where one begins and the other ends. If we get AI engineering wrong, could it wipe out all of humanity? Certainly. Give me a percentage chance. No idea. No one knows. Nobody can say anything intelligent about that question. So if I said um, that that should be the number one thing we think about is AI alignment, because there's any chance yeah. yes. that it's existential, would that feel like the right base assumption to operate from? Exactly. Okay. Uh, that makes sense to me. Um, now, going back to, this was all nested inside of an idea, and I just wanted to make sure that we got all of that clear. So yeah. we're building from the base assumption that if we don't engineer or birth, in your words, AI correctly, it has some chance, however slight, to completely annihilate humanity. And therefore, you have to take this extraordinarily um, seriously. Step number one, if I can get people to uh, recognize, believe, I'm not sure which of those is more apt, but if I can get them to recognize that, that not dying, we're drawing a line right now, though I think we yeah. need to come back to this, uh, between not dying and living forever. But if I can get people to understand that for the first time ever, not dying is a real possibility, yeah. uh, that that will hopefully create the fundamental shift in the way that they think about um, humanity going forward that's going to be necessary to do AI right, to align it well. Okay. Now, all of that was nested inside of this idea that COVID happens. We have this unbelievable response. We um, marshal forces quickly in a way that we never thought we could. I assume this is tied to the idea of how don't die as a religious movement could sweep, that AI could present an existential threat, question, glimmer of, of something, hey, if we don't address this immediately and with the forcefulness of the entire yeah. world in yeah. unity, yeah. we're in real trouble. So that sets the table. Now the question becomes, you and I may look at what happened during COVID differently. I am horrified by the authoritarian tap dance to grab power mm -hmm. that happened during that time. Mm -hmm. And that is literally why I am 
super in love with AI and deploying it as fast as I can. <laughs> and cannot wait to see it yeah. come to fruition. Yeah. And at the same time, yeah. I'm like reading about Mao's China. I'm reading about Stalin's Russia. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like just really getting more and more paranoid by the day about how often and quickly this goes wrong. Yeah. So do you have a different take? Like was COVID only a beautiful thing from your perspective and it like showed how we can come together and that you look at that as the blueprint for AI? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, COVID was an unmitigated disaster for everyone. And uh, I don't think, it, it, for me, it played out exactly how you would expect it to play out among warring humans. Warring humans, yes. Right, yeah. I didn't see it coming. I thought it was going to be beautiful. And in the first <laughs> few weeks when it felt beautiful and everyone came together, yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then it rapidly yeah, fell apart. It's, just, it's so algorithmic. I mean, it's exactly how humans behave in mass. There's zero surprises about the whole thing. But what I'm suggesting is I'm just introducing the idea that we oftentimes think that something is impossible until it's not. And what I'm suggesting right now is in this moment, you and I could be talking about a thousand different things like, you know, fashion or politics, or drama, or like whatever's happening, that can fill the air. And what I'm suggesting is that we do this and it consumes our attention at the cost of realizing this bigger picture phenomena, which you just said. Aligning with AI and making sure our, her our Earth is actually inhabitable and that we humans don't annihilate ourselves is the most significant situation on planet earth it is much more important than anything else in existence we could be talking about and i was first to say you know like you're saying you don't trust others uh, you don't trust authority you don't trust individuals technically i said i have a problem okay. with authority and i don't trust individuals but yes yeah. slightly in and, my mind two different things yeah okay so yes on the, both those things i don't trust myself I don't, Same. I don't yes. trust what my mind says. I don't trust what my mind wants to do. I don't trust what it thinks it wants. I don't trust my mind. And my entire life has been a process of learning to not trust my mind. And so a thought experiment for me that really helps make this clear is if I travel in time and I hang out with Homo erectus a million years ago. So they have an ax in their hand and we say Homo erectus wears food, wears sh with shelter, and wears danger we listen to their answers because they know. Then we say, what is the future of the species? And we laugh because there's no way they're going to imagine all the things we have today, this set, uh, the technology we have, our, our ability to travel outside of the Earth's biosphere. In this moment, I think it's reasonable to imagine that we are the equivalent of Homo erectus. That's how primitive we are in our thoughts. We, ha we have nothing intelligent to say about the future. The only thing, and I've, as I've gone through this thought process, I've come back to this observation, the only intelligent thing I can say right now in this moment is that I don't want to die. Even one layer above that, I don't know. And that's never been the case uh, as a species. We've, we've never had a wall of fog right in front of us. And so um, I think it's possible that we could be steps away from the most extraordinary existence to ever happen in the galaxy. That our consciousness could be more expansive than we have imagination to contemplate. That requires us to sober up a little bit and realize what's happening right now and rise above ourselves because the way we do things now is probably going to lead to, to some undesirable outcome if we don't resituate ourselves on a new goal. Okay, so I'll call that human alignment. How do we align humans? Step number one, you're trying to get people excited. You might be able to live forever. You're hoping that causes a shift. Is that your only card or is there another card to play? Yeah, so I'm suggesting that every single one of us should become all problems. And so if I say that I don't want to die individually, that's what I built Blueprint for, is to say, how can I scientifically 
not die as an individual. If I say, how can we stop the earth from being uninhabitable? So how do we actually take on climate change? Now, typically the mind goes to, I'm going to recycle my Amazon box. I'm going to vote for somebody who does this. Or I'm going to, you know, like these are the paths our mind typically think. No one thinks I'm going to become climate change. And so the way you do that is you realize that we treat planet Earth the same way we treat our bodies. That relationship is identical. We pollute the Earth however we want, just like we pollute our bodies however we want. There's no constraints on what we do. And so if I'm going to become the climate change problem, I'm going to adopt this uh, no not die infrastructure in my own life. Like I'm going to try to go to zero death across all aspects. If I want to align with AI, I think of myself as 35 trillion cells. And so what I'm trying to say is, uh, yes, I'll finish that thought. I'm 35 trillion cells. I need to get 35, intel 35 trillion intelligent agents to want one thing. And it's not have fun with friends. It's not meaning making. It's not you know whatever. It's don't die. I'm reduced to one goal above all goals. And so in that way, I'm acknowledging that I'm one part in an 8 billion person part game and that there's power in each one of us doing these things individually. And that prevents us from saying, I'm going to want something and to take action, I'm going to blame everyone else. I'm going to point my finger and say, everyone else is doing something wrong or they should be doing this or that. I'm trying to say every single one of us owns this problem that we have to solve don't die by ourselves first and then collectively. So it's a mass call for all of us to be that. And so to also to answer your question on don't die, don't die is a recipe book. Don't die is a medical protocol. Don't die is an engineering guide. Don't die is a uh, economic plan. Don't die is philosophical. Don't die is religious. Like don't die is all things. It's applicable to every domain. So if you're an AI engineer and you're building AI, what are you building it to do? What are its attributes? How do you train it? What's the feedback mechanism? Who do you sell to? What do they do with it? These are all very practical things. If you're a don't die in building that, you've got guardrails now what you're going to do other than just this maximize how much money you're going to make with this given thing. Okay. Um, the area that I am deeply concerned by in that analysis is that I, the idea of becoming the problem, I'm not sure you're seeing um, what actually drives human beings. So you talked about, uh, we have this wall of fog and the only yeah. thing I know is don't die. Everything, even one step above that doesn't make sense. I'm not going to be able to comment. You might not have wisdom to offer, but there is a thing that's driving you. So this goes back to my thing about you have evolutionarily planted algorithms running in your mind. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a way around that. And this is, I think, the, the thing that um, is the problem to solve. So when people talk about AI and they say the problem to solve is alignment, when I think about humans, the problem to solve is everyone, mm -hmm. you included in my estimation, are slaves to those algorithms. So for instance, you, you are saying that I don't think you would do the things the algorithm was telling you to do from diet, sleep, all of that, if it made you hate your life and feel worse about yourself. It makes you feel great. You say, I've never been happier. And you say that as a way of saying, see, it works. You're not saying, um, it, it's just about the clock. I'm miserable. I hate it, but I yeah. can see that my aging clock is slowed down and therefore I'm going to keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. It's I'm happier. I feel better. I sleep better. I have better cognition. Yeah. That is a response not to truth. That is a response to the evolutionary algorithm running in your brain makes thinking clearly and being well rested feel awesome. Hmm. And so I would say you're pursuing feeling awesome. So when I think about uh, becoming climate change, for instance, People pollute because of the tragedy of the commons. They are, it, it is exactly the same as money printing. The government prints money because it socializes losses. It says, hey, everybody, we're all going to share. We're all going to get diluted by printing extra money. So no, no one class group, yeah. anything is going to, uh, me as a giant corporation, 
I'm pumping this into the river because the river carries it away. Yeah. And so now it's like, eh, it's all of our problems. Anybody that had to worry about, it, so it's not just me anymore that has, I still have to deal with it, mm -hmm. but it's now manageable for me because I'm only one of all of us that has to deal with that. And so I have a profit motive and a distribution of pain and suffering yeah. that incentivizes me to do that. So that to me, those are algorithms at work. For better or yeah. worse, yeah. the only way to get so far, the only way to get humans to act as a collective. One, we have an evolutionary algorithm as a social species, so there is massive amounts of cooperation, no doubt, but we need a religious element to really yeah. get us. So I get why zero or uh, don't die has that element to it. That tends to take a long time, and it's only in group, and religions kill yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that becomes the thing that I worry about is what you end up seeing is to get something done at the population level, an authority has to come in and force it upon you. Mm -hmm. And there was an awesome meme going around. It says what um, authoritarian leaders claim to be doing. And it shows the care bears and yeah. like love yeah. shooting <laughs> out of their hearts. Yeah. And it says what they're actually doing. And it shows a real photo of a young woman being, um, she's kneeling, facing a wall with her hands behind her head and somebody has an AK-47 pointed yeah. at the back of her head. Yeah. Now for fans of history, you will know that I can't fathom how many millions of people have died in that kind of state-sponsored yeah. government violence. Yeah. Uh, you need look no farther than Pax Mongolia for just like an unimaginable amount of brutality or hey, yeah. go back, Hitler, anyone heard of him? So uh, all of this stuff goes just horrifically wrong because of yeah. the algorithms running in the human mind. Yeah. Crossing that chasm seems impossible, if I'm honest. Like, I don't know how we use, this will be good for you as a way to get everybody to fall in line. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you on it feels impossible. And... I guess the question is, what could possibly happen to make that impossible imagination possible? I have one answer. Yeah. Which you and I are talking about this off camera. So you and I approach this very differently. My thing is I, I like to show people how I think, even though I know uh, no yeah. one should listen to me on how yeah. to align yeah. AI. I just yeah. do not know enough about yeah. the problem. Yeah. However, it's fun to walk through, here's how I try to think up from first principles. So I may change my mind in an hour and realize yeah. that there was something I missed, yeah. but he, on AI alignment, you have to get AI aligned. Yeah. The only way I can see to do that is to make AI completely agnostic to outcome. It cannot want something because the moment it wants life over death, the moment it wants to make sure that you get yeah. the outcome that you asked for, now all of a sudden you get into deranging yeah. territory where you get the paperclip maximizer problem. Yeah. You ask the AI with all the good intentions in the world, hey, make us more paperclips, become efficient at making paperclips. Yeah. And then it suddenly looks at you and goes, oh man, the atoms in your body be way better, sure, more sure. useful configured as sure. paperclips. Uh, so I think that problem is so pernicious. The only thing that you can do is make AI completely agnostic such that when asked to stop, it will stop immediately. Now, does that carry some fourth, fifth order consequence that I'm not looking at? Almost certainly. Yeah. But that that is me doing my best to think up from anything that wants something. If it is, if its sole reason for existing is to optimize for that, then I know eventually I become an anthill in the way of it creating. Yeah to yeah. reaching its goal. Yeah. And so it will just become, if it's a billion times smarter than us, it just will be so indifferent. And it will know what you want doesn't really matter. Because I have to think, as the AI, I have to think population level. Mm -hmm. So anyway, a kill switch yeah. is basically my punchline. That it's yeah. designed to do no harm, that it doesn't want one thing over another. When it's told to stop, it stops. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I guess if I, if I try to, piece certain things together in my mind to make sense at this moment. Because everything you said, they're good arguments, they're reasonable arguments, like they're, they're based upon this reality. When I read history and I look back at momentous times, almost always the solution to these problems 
were unimaginable to those who existed in that time. It, it just came from nowhere. That's happened repeatedly. Can you give us some examples? Uh, like um, discovering, so discovering that microscopic objects that were beyond the resolution of the eyes, these things called germs, were responsible for infection and death. And that simple things like washing one's hands and cleaning instruments between surgeries would lessen that death rate and increase the uh, mortality, uh, increase uh, uh, lifespans. The idea that microscopic objects could be an influential thing in our lives was absurd. Absolute bonkers. Turned out to be true. And that's just happened throughout history. And so in this moment, I think it's reasonable to say, just like history has been full of these moments, that the solution to our problems is probably unimaginable to us currently. You know, no one thought that when, when in early New York, when horses were the primary mode of transport and manure was the biggest problem in New York, polluting the Hudson and making everyone sick, no one thought the Model T would be the solution to horse manure. It just wasn't on people's minds. And so if I st stack this together and say, okay, um, we may not know the solution and all of us can make really compelling arguments about this moment, if we also say it's possible that our intelligence relative to AI in the very near future, that we are like Homo erectus, absolutely primitive in our cognition. And we start layering those two on top. Now we, have to, now we can say maybe it's a case the solution is unimaginable. Maybe it's a case that we are as primitive as cavemen in our own ability to contemplate the future. Then what do we say? Like what is, what, what can we possibly say that is intelligent if those are true? And this is where I come back to don't die. Our, we are currently transitioning as a species. Humans are the stewards of all knowledge. We have discovered things, we've acquired knowledge as a species, we learn it, we memorize it, we regurgitate it, we reinforce it with each other, we own all knowledge. AI is now becoming the steward of all knowledge. It is much better at discovering in many, in many places and becoming better every day, and it's much better at maintaining that knowledge than any one of us individually. We can query that knowledge base, but we're no longer the stewards. AI is becoming the steward. So we don't even have that as our authority anymore. It's going to be soon passed on somewhere else. Now, if we're in that situation, what is the manifestation of our intelligence? And that's where I arrive at this conclusion is in this moment, I'm much better off saying yes to an algorithm that improves my being at the speed of an iPhone. I want the algorithm to be pulling from discovery and from insight and improving me at this rapid rate rather than me being this silly form of intelligence making the same mistakes again and again and again. Now, I realize that we have fear of uh, government and power and people. That's all true. And I'm suggesting as a species, we are not trustworthy. We know this to be true. This is not something that should be taken as an offense. I'm not trustworthy. You're not trustworthy. Governments are not trustworthy. No one's trustworthy. And we shouldn't trust anyone. We should have a new form of societal structures that does not require this trust, because we're just not we're not worthy of it in this in this moment. There's a better form of intelligence now. AI has its limitations. It needs to grow and mature. It's got its own problems, certainly. So both forms of intelligence have the strengths and weaknesses. And I'm suggesting if you look at the two forms of intelligence, it's much more reasonable to bet on the improvement of AI than it is the improvement of the human condition. It's a much better bet. And if I'm going to look at one of those forms of intelligence as which one takes us into this extraordinary future, I'd much rather bet on this one as being the, the one that is able to help us mature beyond our current primitive selves. Okay, so if those are the two paths you see before us, uh, AI helps us evolve into what we can become, or humans have to get themselves there. Which do you think I would bet on? 
it probably depends on whether you perceive you to be in control of the algorithm or whether you perceive another entity to be uh, in control of the algorithm. I think if you perceive the algorithm to be within your control that is solely after your own benefit and acting as your in your best interest and also as a guardian of your best interest in relation to others, I think you'd say yes. If you felt like the algorithm was influenced by another form of power that could somehow hurt you for their benefit, you would say no. That's really helpful to see how you see my perspective. Um, that's very close. So what I would say is it seems self-evident that the AI is our only hope of us transcending human nature. We've seen human nature play out over the last how many yeah. thousands of years. So I think we can feel pretty good looking forward that we know what that looks like, barring yes. something like, uh, and we actually have never killed ourselves despite the radical changes in climate that we've already lived through, uh, despite now us messing with the climate on top of the fact that the climate is already just unstable over long enough periods of time, asteroids, on and on and on. Uh, so yes, AI, I think, is your only hope of transcending that muck. If you love coffee and a little bit of caffeine, but hate the jitters and that afternoon crash that comes with it, there is finally a coffee replacement that you've got to try. It's from Peak and it's called Nandika. Nandika is made from the highest quality ingredients and claims to activate your metabolism, promote healthy levels of testosterone production, and provide sustained energy without the jitters or a crash. With slow release caffeine that comes from fermented probiotic teas, Nandika delivers an energy boost that lasts throughout the day so you can stay focused and productive. Peak has well over 15,000 five-star reviews and for a limited time you can get up to 15% off plus a free rechargeable frother and cup with my link peaklife.com slash impact. Click the link in the description or go directly to peaklife.com slash impact to get up to 15% off plus two free gifts. Now, I also think that humans have, if it isn't basically 0% like true existential risk, because even if we nuked each other back 10,000 years, mm -hmm. which would be horrific, I don't think that it would be existential. Not to downplay it, it's something worthy of dramatic concern. But I'll put us as like low probability, very low probability of a true existential threat. AI, on the other hand, is, is either going to be utopia or just total existentially wiping us from the face of the earth or from the universe. Uh, so that's the one where I'm like, okay, we have to be really careful of this thing that we're playing with. So mm -hmm. I, I ask you that question only so that you know, as I lay out the the yeah. following argument that it is we both agree that ai is our only shot of overcoming what i will call um we're, we're humans we we're animals we are very encumbered by the evolutionary things that run in our brain as evidenced by obesity right we just the most basic thing yeah. we can't escape yeah so okay we want ai to work but the bad news is that it is going to be, I would say, nearly impossible to get humans to use it well, to not yeah. use it as a weapon, to not just make it another thing yeah. Yeah. that we add to the arsenal of problems. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to figure out is what we're going to do to cross that chasm. So let me ask you a, what I think is a very interesting thought experiment that will help map out um, maybe our value systems. Not sure yeah. exactly how to um, lay out what this is going to reveal, but it will help. Let's flash forward seven years. AI is really taking off. We certainly have general intelligence. We may have the bottom rung of super intelligence. Uh -huh. It's changed your life in ways that are already unimaginable. Yeah. Um, the don't die religion is really taking off and everybody's lives that are in that religion are better. Let's say it's the fastest growing religion of all time. And then there's Tom Bilyeu. And he just won't shut the fuck up. 
about AI dangers. And I'm slowing the adoption of don't die. And the AI says, Brian, listen, love Tom, great kid, bad news. He is causing, I mean, I just know the math. He's going to cause uh, 42,000,000.784213 million deaths yeah. um, just because he's, he's going to delay this by 72 days. And that's how many people we're going to lose. Um, so I'm just going to need you to kill him. Would you? I, I'll take um, a small detour around the thought experiment. Oh, come on. <laughs> but <I'll>, Brian Johnson. <laughs> I'll come back to it. Okay, so if you look at the history of trading, initially people, We're talking Silk Roads here? Uh, yeah, just like you, okay. you know, people exchange objects, you know, they trade these physical objects, then you introduce currency, then introduce, you know, like you're going forward, and now you've got algorithms running, you know, high speed machine learning algorithms trading stocks at timescales that we humans can't. They have access to more data, uh, they can make decisions faster than humans. A significant portion of our economy is run by algorithms. That same process is going to happen with our own health and wellness and even our own cognition. And so currently, we have biological processes happening at multiple timescales within our body, proteins and genes and blood and delivery of nutrients, all these things. And um, we operate at a certain timescale on reality. As we get better with technology to have it inside our body and outside our body, our bodies and our health and wellness are going to be like a high frequency trading stock market. You're going to have things doing protein folding and, and misfolding exchange. It's going to be real time and it's going to be faster than our cognition. And so these algorithms are going to do this and you, Tom, are going to say yes to these things because it's going to allow you to stay alive. So you're going to have these algorithms that will increasingly take better care of you than you can yourself. Now, as part of that, it's probably going to help you sleep and it's probably going to help you focus and it's probably going to help you problem solve. And at some point, the line between your thought and the algorithm thought is probably going to be blurred because you're becoming the synthesis of all these different systems. And so your thought experiment assumed that we've moved forward in the future, but you are the exact same person as you are now with the same cognition, the same proclivities, the same perceived free will. And I don't know if that's fair. That's the same thing that Blade Runner did. Blade Runner marches forward all the way. I think it's 2049 or something like that. Yeah. Everything is futuristic. Like the droids are, like the environment is, except for humans, human behavior, human thought, and human action. So that's the, the – and movie makers have to do that because otherwise it's not relatable. You can't make an unintelligible, unintelligible creature make it be a, a big hit. And so your thought experiment assumes these things stay the same about you, but in that moment – I would imagine your cognition is unimaginable to your stance right now. There's no way you can op occupy your mind state in seven years from now when you're now in this mesh of technology. And in this bigger web, I'm suggesting that the, we do goal alignment today in society. Like we have rules like you can't be violent. You know, if you do, you're going to have a, pay a penalty and you're probably going to go to jail. So we have these rules, these guardrails. Our systems of goal alignment are going to get more robust to a point where maybe nobody can hurt anyone under any circumstance. That's just how the tapestry of our computational goal alignment works. And so we can't hurt ourselves. We can't hurt each other. And in that moment, so this right now, this thought experiment, people will be like, that sounds fucking dystopic. But when we arrive there, we'll be like, this makes total sense. Why would I want to commit self-harm? Why would I want to hurt someone else? And you just eliminate all the problems of humans throughout history. This is going to sound unimaginable to most everyone listening to this. Why, why couldn't it be the case? If we just walk down the natural steps of our integration with technology, by definition, we can't define what those mental states will be. So I'm neither right nor wrong. It's just a contemplation. But what I'm suggesting is that most likely the future is unimaginable to us. And any time we presuppose anything 
we are probably wrong because we, we can't imagine right or wrong. So in that scenario, I don't even know what to say because I don't know how I would feel because I can't presuppose I even know my disposition towards you in seven years from now and you can't imagine how you feel. And this is what I'm saying is like, this is why I try to reduce all of reality to the only intelligent thing I can say, which is don't die. I can literally say nothing intelligent above that. I'm absolutely constrained as an intelligent being in this moment. I can run my mouth and say a, th a thousand things. They're all foolish. They're all just this time and place that over the period of time, the 25th century will not care about. It has no meaning whatsoever. Okay, uh, then I'm going to have to trap you. So I'm going to ask you a question I've heard you answer before. Uh, if Because here's here's what I think the big problem is. I have, um, I have a base assumption that we as a society, the thing we're actually going to have to deal with is the chasm, where the algorithms are headed in the right direction, but yeah. we need people to change for the algorithms to keep moving in the right direction. That chasm is where all the action is. Mm. And your answer, at least to that question is, well, you just have to assume on the other side of that, we can't even imagine how we think, so I'm not even going to comment on it. But we are going to have to cross that chasm mm -hmm. and from where I'm sitting. And that is that is what we have to think through. Yeah. Okay, so the question I'm going to ask you to trap you in your own answers- I can't uh, wait. Is if the algorithm were to whisper in your ear, uh, people shouldn't have kids and- Remember, yeah, it knows what's better for you, for the planet, for the species, everything. Yeah. And it just says, yeah, I don't have kids. Would you then not have kids and tell other people don't have kids? Yeah, it depends on the maturity of the algorithm. Okay, I, sure. Yeah, so I know, for example, from building this algorithm for the past three years with my health and wellness, we've built a solid intuition observing the accuracy of this algorithm. So you take a given measurement of my body, you look at the scientific evidence, you do the intervention, and then you measure again. And so we have been able to witness the accuracy of this entire process again and again. And it is superior to any doctor I've seen in the same time period. So in this moment, if an algorithm were to make a recommendation on my health and wellness, I would trust the algorithm over any human doctor. So in that regard, yes, it's there. Now, if you take it into other applications, you know, like children, uh, I, I don't, I don't have, I have no data on whether that would be an algorithm I would trust or not. So it reaches certain thresholds. Like for example, you know, uh, if you're on a ship and you're using a, a depth finder on your ship, that's pretty good technology, and you can probably rely the depth finder is telling you the proper depth, and you're not going to run ashore. Uh, same thing with a, you know, a radar gun. Like, is it clocking the speed of a baseball in the car at the proper speed? Yes. So certain technologies, certain levels of confidence, we know how to trust them. So I'd say I look at the confidence interval of whether that thing is superior to human intelligence. And this is the entirety of my argument is that human intelligence has been the superior form of intelligence, and it is now being surpassed by AI in more fields than ever contemplated, which gives rise to not to something scary, but to the opportunity that we can say, amazing, a new version of intelligence is here, it's superior to our own, we're going to adopt it and become a better species. But to do that, we kind of have to be willing to reconcile, leaving behind the inferior aspects of our, tech, of our own selves. And that creates fear of loss, it creates fear of dystopia, it creates all the fears that we've been talking about. So it's a very scary process to go through. So I understand why people uh, grapple with these notions. It's not easy to say yes, especially when we live in a society that is fundamentally not trustworthy in this moment. So the way that you answered the question in the past, and I'm certainly, I don't want to make you feel like you have to be consistent with that if you've changed your mind. But what you said in the past was, yes, I'm completely open to rewriting the way that I think about the world. Yeah. Um, and this is where, this is part of that crossing the chasm, getting other people to adopt it. I think we are, it's very much like the trolley problem, which seems like this really abstract thing until you realize you have to program self-driving cars to make a yeah. decision. Do I kill a cat? a baby, a human, a pregnant woman, like what it, if there are four corners that it could choose, but on each one of them is a different thing that it's going to most likely kill. You have to tell it how to make that decision. Right. And 
we are going to be in that zone of what do we tell people in terms of how to get the cultural, you said we need a big cultural change. We're gonna have to tell the culture, this is the new value system you should adopt, which is really what I'm trying to figure out right now is what your value system is. So for instance, I'll, I'll answer the question, see how this sits with you. Um, I have a value system that may be deranged to your point, I'm very open to over time realizing, oh my God, a better intelligence comes along, shows me that this is just a dumb way to think about it. But I so value people being able to make a choice, especially if it is, they're not doing anything. They're not, sorry, they're not hurting anyone. In fact, this is something that we have to define. You said something that really freaked me out a few minutes ago, where you were like, we may get to the point where we don't let each other hurt each other. Yeah. Now we're living through a moment where what people are saying is is violence is absurd yeah. to me. So now we're we're seeing people um, attacking speakers on campus because they think that their words are violence and that their yeah. words are genocide. I mean, like crazy shit, man. Yeah. And they will actually harm that person yeah. because they think that their words are hurting other people. Now, I disagree aggressively with their assessment of harm and hurt and violence yeah. and all that. So that that's where I'm like, this problem has to be dealt with. This We're watching humans right now in real time grapple with this. Yeah. And so again, I'm with you on the when the AI is there and when people adopt it, now we've got something amazing. I wanna get to that side of the chasm. I'm with you. But to cross that chasm, uh, we're gonna have to define terms like that. We're gonna have to decide if Tom is slowing down the adoption of don't yeah. die and people, the the algorithm just runs the math and is like, I know to just a 100% uh, degree of certainty that this many extra people will die because I can see the rate at which he slows down the adoption of this ideology and therefore killing that one person just makes more sense than killing the 47 million. And what I'm trying to get to is from my value system, you can't do that. Like even though it's one life versus 47 million with my value set, because that person is just saying what they believe to be true and I value, I mean, I'll wrap it in free speech. I'm not a free speech absolutist, but I'm extraordinarily close. I like the way we say you can incite violence. I think those things are good. Um, but even there, you have to be careful, like in yeah. terms of, giving people the power to say, well, this does incite violence because that person, yeah. whatever, yeah. simple thing. From my perspective, they said that other people think is, yeah. is violence. Um, so that's my value set. What I get that you're saying on the other side that you'll think completely differently, I would think completely differently and all that. But just from a value standpoint today, Brian Johnson, what do you think is ought, and I use the word ought on purpose, ought you kill me mm -hmm. or ought you let me live? <laughs> uh, first on your trolley problem, the, again, the, the likely, so we've created this thought experiment that basically creates a conundrum for our current morals and ethics. There's no answer that is satisfactory. Every answer is bad. And that's the value of the thought experiment is you say, we have technology and it basically leads to loss in every direction because you can't reconcile morals and ethics. So it's a really, it's a really big problem. And so if you think about the future of what might the future of don't die look like, you could say, well, society is a tapestry of goal alignment where it's structured in a way where no moving object can ever be at risk of killing another being. The physics of that thing stopping can never be in excess to its ability to stop. So by, de by definition, human harm by a moving object is impossible because of the computational tapestry of sensors on the human, sensors on the machine, the physics of the stopping, uh, you know, the backup systems behind it. Now, in that regard, you, know, you have a solution that no one thought of. So it's like, well, we had this thought experiment. It broke everyone's minds. And then the solution was, actually, <laughs> you just solve it by physics. And so these are the kinds of things where I'm saying that we we stumble around with these things. And then we arrive in the future. It's like, oh, that's pretty simple. We solved that. And But oftentimes, people just get stuck in thinking we can't move forward because this problem is unsolvable. When in reality, there's absolutely a solution for it. With 
with your thought experiment on killing you or not. And why, <laughs> why are you making me a murderer? <laughs> the, the, uh, I mean, first of all, do I even have authority to make this decision? In, in the thought experiment, yes. Wait, how did I get it? Uh, well, because you are doing a very good job of shepherding this movement into existence. Um, and the AI in this scenario doesn't have opposable thumbs yet. And so <laughs> it needs, it needs a little human intervention. And because you so believe in the accuracy of its assessment of the number of people that will die based on my words and my ability to persuade them to a worse way of life, uh, it knows that you would be um, the most likely candidate to do the right thing, even though it is very hard. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. You're gonna hate me for this answer. <laughs> uh, he uh, he built he he builds AI, and we spent a few hours talking about new mathematical models for goal alignment. Mm. So John Nash built the Nash equilibrium. Yeah. You know with. A beautiful and, mind. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, like a gorgeous mathematical model on how humans negotiate and arrive at solutions. And we were talking about mathematical models on how you would actually build alignment. And I'm not a mathematician. He is. And I found it to be enlightening that the elegant ways in which math is a substrate of intelligence that is superior to my own right, wrong cognition. That I in like in that conversation, I saw how limited my own brain is because my brain wants to structure things into good and bad. It wants to create tribes like this tribe and that tribe. It wants to create. So my mind has a a limited set of dimensional structures on how it resolves conflict. And math is much more expansive. And even creative in its ability to a model, you know, paired up with these with these uh, machine learning models, and I walked away from that conversation feeling overjoyed that we could be leveling up as a species in our own language of how we understand each other, how we resolve our differences, how we repair the things that are broken. We have such a limited set. I mean, so many of our fights in society are born from misunderstandings of our own cognition, my inability to understand you and your inability to understand me and our ability to construct language that is conciliatory. Even when we're trying our best, we just can't quite inhabit our own, each other's perspectives. And I think these new mathematical models could. That's what gives me hope for the future. And so in this scenario, you know, the reality you occupy in this future Tom state and the reality I occupy in my state, you know, there's like a reality in which we perceive, there's a reality which is running the computational substrate beneath us. Do they, are they the same thing? Are they different things? Is my perceived reality the same as what my live reality? I don't know. Like we kind of get into some really fun territory of what is reality? What is perception? What is my lived experience? What is my real experience? And this is where I think we're going. We, we're, we are that primitive in contemplating this future. We're that blind to it. And so every time I come up my, in my own thinking of a limitation of some unsolvable problem, I just have to give myself a reminder, a few of these examples of how primitive I am. Like, oh yeah, I'm homo erectus. Like we're definitely walking into this much more elaborate and beautiful way of being. So I think uh, if, if it's the scenario, Tom, where you had those thoughts and that that was your honest reaction to reality, I would have confidence that we could reconcile it and we'd find an outcome. It wouldn't require a murder. It wouldn't require me making a decision. We'd figure it out. Like we would sort and we'd probably have stability and like we don't want to die. Maybe our versions of different of don't die are different. That's fine. But we can find a solution here. That's why the AI wants to deal with you 
Um, I think you're eminently reasonable. Uh, while I am admittedly sad uh, yeah. that I, I got such a nuanced answer, because I do, I think ultimately we are going to have to program these. A AI is good at optimization. If you don't tell it what to optimize for, you will never get there. Now, I'm not privy to the math that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. But anyway, I love how nuanced you're being. Um, I think that's really important. Now, the one thing I will say, though, I think there is a reality to be faced, which is that there are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. And the thing I'm trying to get at with my question, I ended up writing a few questions mm -hmm. like this that I wanted to ask, like the algorithm tells you to do this. Do you do it? The algorithm tells you mm -hmm. to do that. Do you do it? Um, because it maps out what we will ask the AI to optimize for. It maps out our value system. It yeah. maps out, and I get it. You're saying, look, the AIs are going to change us. They're going to change the way we think. And I think all of that's true, but that will not remove the reality that everything is a trade off. I wrote a comic book called Neon Future. Um, and I want to play this clip back in like seven years because this is what's going to happen. I am certain of it. Okay. The world's going to bifurcate, and there will be people that adopt the algorithms and there will be people that flat reject it plain and simple and you're going to see like a pure hu human movement it'll be something yeah. like that yeah. and there will be extreme conflict between yeah. the two groups and what i was contemplating at the time was uh people are going to start actually putting technology inside their body mm -hmm. and there's going to be a violent reaction against that, a very religious tribal reaction. Yeah. And I, we were playing with AI in it. I wish I had made AI like the central focus. It's more of a focus than people realize in, in the early episodes for something that we haven't revealed yet. But anyway, um, given that that from where I'm sitting is inevitable, it is the human condition. It's just the way that people work. Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Uh, you have the people that live off in the woods because they're just not willing to give up reading. That was the first time that that really put on my mind. Oh yeah, like mm. people will create these alternate societies. Um, I, I have yet to see on planet earth with humans where two different tribes decide to just let the other one live in peace. Okay, so let's pose this question to Homo erectus. What becomes the species? Uh, is Homo erectus capable of imagining the presence of 8 billion people on this planet? And, you know, several billion of them cooperating on a shared infrastructure, the internet, every day. And, you know, like, could Homo erectus imagine that kind of scale of human cooperation? as a structure where there's still conflict. And so I agree with you, if you map today's reality to the future, you probably, you reasonably conclude those things. That's algorithmic, that's how humans have always behaved. The, the difference here is that the intelligence we're giving birth to will be so much more intelligent than us. It's very hard to model that out. Um, I agree with your premise, though, that conflict is inevitable, that we're going to go through a rough patch as a species, and it's an open question of whether we make it through. It's doubtful that it's going to be kumbaya. So, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to, to offer up a tangible rebuttal to that. Uh, it seems likely, but at the same time... Uh, yeah, I mean, like, okay, so like, if we give this a thought, you know, like, give it a minute to breathe. Like, let's imagine we're giving birth to um, super intelligence, and we find out that we can dramatically slow the speed of aging and not and almost reverse it. So people are basically achieving immortality or perceived immortality or like some radically extended life, like something that that changes the the frame from death being inevitable to us having some unknown time horizon. And so if you lean into the systems, you get access to this and let's just say it's accessible. If you don't, you wanna go out and live in the forest and die like a homo sapien, that's your prerogative. 
uh, and that simultaneous to this being possible, that the authority structures of society, of our ability to do mass harm to each other, are arrested. That basically the majority, let's just say, I'm just making stuff up, like the majority of our systems right now uh, have computational control over access to uh, annihilation level weapons. And let's imagine that our computational systems arrest those abilities in some form or fashion. Now again, this is sci-fi, this is like a movie plot, this is, right, these are, these are things that are all very hard to believe. And in this moment, uh, in any other moment, it would be reasonable for someone to say, that's silly to make that contemplation process. It's not. And this is what I, you know, back, this is like the genesis of Blueprint, is I was, I was posing this question, what would the 25th century respect? What, what is seemingly impossible and are we blinded to in this moment? And so I'm, I am open-minded to the impossible being the most likely scenario in the future. I don't, I don't think, actually that's, pro okay, so I, I assume the impossible is much more probable than the likely. There we go. That's what I would say on this one. Okay. Uh, let me say that back in different words and make sure that I understand it. Given the power of AI to upgrade our thinking and to, and we're now going to have to define zeroth principle thinking, yeah. it's a AI's ability to pull forth something we've never thought of. Yeah. Lisa Dahl, when he played yes. the AI that beat him at Go, said it plays like an alien. Yes. And that always gave me the chills. Yes. Like that sense of, whoa, it's yeah. approaching the game from an angle so oblique mm -hmm. that even though this game's been played for a thousand years and the most brilliant human minds have all gone into this game and played it, none of them approach the game from such an unexpected angle. Uh, so you walked us through some zero principle things earlier, but that idea that the unknown unknown will become known yeah. thanks to AI. Okay, so given that that reality is inevitable, it is far more likely that we do what we now think of as impossible then that the human algorithm that we've all been dealing with for millennia is the thing that has enough energy to push forward. It's clear. Yeah. I want to believe it. I still think that we have to cross the chasm. I still think that that's a bloody nightmare, but that's a very clear statement. Yeah. Okay, can you walk us through, please? Zero with thinking. I pride myself on thinking from first principles. Mm -hmm. um, whatever success I've had in life is brought to you by first principles thinking, yeah. um, not getting trapped in, well, this is how it's always been done and therefore that's how we do it. It, it really is powerful. Yeah. Um, but zero with thinking, which I hate that that's the real way to say that, by the way. <laughs> zero with. Zero with, yeah. yeah. Um, it's three syllables. Yeah, I don't know, it just feels weird. But anyway, uh, what is it and can we do it or is it reserved for AI? Yeah. All of us are capable of zeroth principle thinking. Only a few humans have ever have ever achieved it. So, um, the Earth is not the center of the universe. It orbits the sun in a larger galaxy. It is a zeroth principle understanding from where we were at, where the center, the Earth is the center of the universe. You should know the following three numbers, 37,000, 25, 1. 37,000, that is the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system, 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year, so you know that they know what they're doing because they've been around for a long time. That is 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is truly one of a kind. So you're going to need a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth, which you will get from NetSuite. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Right now, 
Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash theory. That's netsuite.com slash theory to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash theory. Do you have to use first principles to get to a zeroth principle insight? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it's entirely a new primitive, like Einstein's discovery of special theory of relativity. That there's a new dimension building on Newtonian physics. It's hard to get there through first principles thinking. Or, you know, uh, from Euclid's elements to Cartesian geometry. So sometimes these ones to zeros are very hard to get to. You just, you're plucking them out of another dimension. So, uh, I mean, like with Go, you know, could humans have discovered the, the, the moves that, that AlphaGo played? Probably. Did they? No. Or was AlphaGo able to discover more game-changing moves in the game Go faster than any human? Yes. You know, like a stunning degree. And so, uh, yeah, first principle thinking is you learn everything you can. You make the fewest number of assumptions given a time frame and you act with that knowledge. And so that's how you go from version one to version two to version three. It's a systematic process to improve based upon what you know. Zeroth principle thinking, you're working with unknown unknowns. So you don't know what you're missing. And when a, so just like if you're a physicist and you're working in Newtonian physics, you don't know another dimension exists in the model of physics until Einstein discovers it with now it rebuilds our entire model of physics. If you're a doctor in the 1870s and your patients are dying at a high rate, you through first principles thinking, you're not discovering these microscopic objects called germs causing infection. You to discover there's this microscopic world of germs is a zero principle insight. And so typically these kinds of insights have come every, you know, few century, a couple, a century or a few decades, like they've been pretty sporadic throughout human history. And AI is a zero manufacturer. It manufactures zero principle insights. And so your humans were good at first principles thinking every once in a while, we do a zero principle insight, you bring AI online, and it just starts manufacturing zeros. And what happens when zeros hit society is it changes our understanding of reality. And we humans have a natural time to adopt new understandings of reality. We're not very fast at it. Sometimes it takes a lifetime, sometimes a few lifetimes, sometimes a few, you know, a few generations. And so what the observation is on zero principle thinking is that AI is going to move society forward at a speed that will be unintelligible to us and be faster than we can imagine and will give us, uh, basically make us dizzy and nauseous because we won't be able to keep up with change. And so this goes back to this idea that we are the stewards of knowledge. We are first principles thinking species. Zeros come, we incorporate it into our knowledge, we rebuild reality, but we get ourselves resituated for the next insight. As AI drops more and more zeros, it becomes not only the steward of first principles thinking, but and of the new zero knowledge and of doing new knowledge on top of that. And so we're moving from a species of knowing to not knowing. That is such a significant <laughs> change in our understanding of reality. Because you know, we, our existence is premised on us knowing. Every time we talk, <laughs> we presume we know or we're offering something we know or we're sharing knowledge. And we're moving to a state where we don't know. We've got to query these intelligent systems to know. And uh, yeah, so zero principle insight is, ba I, I had a, I personally was struggling. I was obsessed about thinking about the future of existence. And I, I saw in my own mind, I would walk up to the frontier and go as far as I could. And then I hit a wall of fog. And my intelligence couldn't punch past the wall of fog. And I got so frustrated with my own limitations and my own intelligence. I went to bed one night and I was thinking, how do I solve this problem? And I had a dream about zero principle thinking. And 
uh, it was like one of the one of the most joyous moments of my entire life, where it just broke this for me that my intelligence could push beyond the fog through the framework of zeroth principle thinking, and then, um, yeah, it just it's become a pillar of my understanding of reality, and much of what we've talked about today is practicing zeroth principle thinking of this idea that. Uh, the trolley problem or the thought experiment of, you know, do we kill Tom or not? Um, first principles would lead you to arrive at a certain observation, but zeroth principle thinking takes you down an entirely different path, just opens up so much more optionality. Or the new math of goal alignment that is a leveling up of our cognition past our simplistic thinking of good and bad and tribes and, you know, the contracts we have right now. Okay, so I wish I were smart enough to really understand zeroth principle thinking, um, because when I go to reach for it, what I come up against is I understand the descriptions that Einstein gave about his thought experiments that led him to have the insights that he had, but they sound just like intuition. Mm. They they aren't. I don't understand the building blocks well enough to say whether he was or wasn't building from first principles. Like I know these things to be true. And therefore, if those are true, the following has to be true. Like quantum physics is first principles thinking from Einstein's equations. Now, the great I irony is that Einstein himself did not believe his own equations. And he has since been proven um, incorrect on one thing for sure so far, uh, which is our universe is not locally real. That's crazy. I don't want to derail the conversation on that, but I will just say that is the one thing that makes me go, maybe we really are in a simulation. <laughs> um, but is, so you said that zero width principle thinking takes you down a path. Can you actually walk us down that path? Or is it that it triggers an intuition in people smart enough to have these kinds of intuitions? Yeah. I mean, so if we just, uh, there's a great book that it's my favorite book, uh, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea. Uh, so it's about zero and the number zero, the number zero. Yeah. And we assume zero is obvious. We have, we've had it our entire lives, but that wasn't true for most of human history. The number zero wasn't really needed. You didn't need zero fish or zero bread. Mm -hmm. And so uh, zero had to be discovered and zero, it took humans hundreds of years to understand zero as it relates to math, as it relates to philosophy, as it relates to art as it relates to every aspect of society. Zero is the, the number zero and the uh, concept of zero is the biggest revolutionary to exist in society. It's not immediately uh, intuitive for people. I saw the interview that you did on Flagrant mm. and you stopped pushing the point. You said, I concede your point because Andrew Schultz was like, <laughs> um, look, people understand they don't have fish. Like they get it. They know they don't have any, you know, whatever. Uh, they're not getting laid. They have zero women, whatever it was. He gave a yeah. bunch of different examples. And finally you were like, look, I concede the point. But I still think the idea may be more radical yeah. than that. Yes. Um, in that, yes, people had an idea of, um, not having a thing, but they didn't think of it as something you could put in a ledger is how I've always read. Yeah. Like it, there's no way to use it in math kind of thing. Um, why is it a dangerous idea? Why is it one of the biggest breakthroughs ever? I actually don't understand. I've, yeah. I've not read that book. I mean, so philosophically, zero was accepted in the East and rejected in the West because in the East, their religious... Uh, ideas were open to nothingness. And in the West, that was the most fearful thing to, to think about existentially or spiritually. And so the West rejected zero as a concept of nothingness. There's always something, and the East embraced it. And so you divided these religious uh, spheres. In the Renaissance, the vanishing point that allows you to do dimensions is a zero. You can't do dimensions in art until you have a vanishing point, right? And so it, if you look throughout history, whether it be in philosophy, whether it be in mathematics, whether it be in art, whether it be in the language of computers of zeros and ones, you can't have the modern world without the number zero. That's really interesting. I'm going to say it in another way. Tell me if you think this gets at the heart of it. Because um, I can feel this be the kind of thing that would 
bring forth cries of heresy, which in a modern lens doesn't seem like a big deal. And then you flash back 500 years and the yeah, guy you killed. Yeah. yeah. Um, that there is a difference between I don't have any apples, but apples still exist versus nothingness. Yeah. No universe, no God. Exactly. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I definitely never thought of and, that before. And even going from like basic math, like Euclid's elements to Cartesian geometry. I don't, I'm too stupid in no. math. I don't, can you walk me through, the audience may tune out, but I'm actually really keen. It, yeah, there's several chapters. There's actually, it's, I think it's my favorite part of the book. There's several level ups in mathematical constructs because of zero. Not worth getting into it now, but math hit certain points in history and then they hit a wall and nobody could punch through. And you had these breakthroughs of building our understanding of math over time, which has allowed us to do these you know, inconceivable things with math today that previous generations couldn't. So I'd say it's worth a read because we, you know, again, like we are born into the world and we have these elegant mathematical models at our disposal to do all things. But humanity had to struggle very hard to punch through these barriers at certain times and zero played a critical role. Okay. Um, so, uh, but the path of thinking in a zeroth principle way, what, so in first principles, in fact, maybe this is a good place to start. So here's how I think from first principles. Um, how do I escape analogy? How do I get down yeah. to what is? So if you think about even just building up from the physical world or like, what is marketing? Marketing is psychology. Oh shit. So marketing isn't funnels. Yeah. Marketing is understanding the human mind, wanting them to do a thing and then getting them to do that thing. So now it's like, oh, I could send an email, I suppose, or I could go on social media, right? And so people that understand that marketing is psychology, they don't get tricked into thinking it's a phone call yeah. or it's a billboard. Th those are just ways in which you can reach the person whom you're trying to influence. But if this is a game of influence, now it becomes anything. It could become mm -hmm. a song. It could be getting a basketball player to wear a pair of shoes. Nike, I'm looking right. at you, right? And so now all of a sudden, when you're thinking from first principles, you're not trapped by what came before you. You can actually lead because you understand the essence of the thing at its most fundamental level, where again, you're not thinking from analogy. Okay, so that's first principles. You just think up yeah. from that. What is this thing at its essence? Yeah. And then boom, yeah. how can this play yeah. out? Okay, so if that's first principles, what is zero with principle? What's the yeah. path I walk? Yeah, I'll make this related to our uh, blueprint and our conversation on the algorithm. Uh, so if you take the 13 colonies and America, it was run by the British monarchy. And so from a first principles perspective, if the US colonies are unhappy, the 13 colonies are unhappy with the monarch, you say, first principles, how are we going to make the monarch better? We need better information flows. We need better decision-making. We need committees. We need like whatever. You can come up with a whole long list of how do you be a better monarch to these 13 colonies? And the 13 colonies came up with, and there's, and, the, there's a gradient between one and zero. Like it's, some, it's not that something is an absolute zero and something is an absolute one. You can be somewhere on the spectrum. The 13 colony said, we kind of have this zeroth idea where our own citizens are going to manage our affairs. Now, we don't, we can't fully understand how bonkers that was. Because that you know, monarchy was the only way to to manage something. Like the idea that you and your fellows are going to run your own institution was something no one had ever done before, and they did it. And so that was a radical departure from the monarchy. So first principles, you just try to perpetually improve the monarchy. Zero, you're like, no, no, we're going to figure out an entirely new form of governance with these representation structures and people voting and like all these different things. And we've been sorting that problem for the past two hundred years. I do the same thing with my body. I said, okay, if I want to be in better health, I can read books, listen to blogs. I can you know, do this. I can do that. Uh, I can use my mind to do it. I can exercise willpower. If I want to eat a dessert, I can say, I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to exercise every day. That's uh, the monarch running me. And I said, I'm going to do a zero, and I'm going to build an algorithm that runs me because it's going to be better at being me than I am. And so I flipped it on its head. And so that's, it's such a radical departure from what is. And if you think about, if you listen to how humans talk about health, wellness, decision-making, self-improvement, anything we do as humans, it's entirely assumed that 
our mind is the best form of intelligence always. We always know what we want to do. We always trust what we want to do. We always trust the decision, and we always have an excuse for why we did it. And I said, that's out. Like, my mind is an inferior form of intelligence relative to this new technology I built to take better care of me than I can myself. That's a zero. And then the same is true for what I'm suggesting for the species, which is we've always thought our minds were the best thing, which it has been true. It's the best thing we've had. But now we're on the precipice of something being better. And the idea that our minds wouldn't be in charge of all things all the time under any circumstance, and then we can tell stories about whatever we did to make sense of it, is unthinkable to people. And this is why what my thought experiment provokes. It demonstrates the unthinkability of doing anything different than what we have right now. And the most basic assumption that we all have about life is that our mind makes every decision in every moment, no matter what. And the future of our existence may be the exact opposite of that thing, which, it, which brings back to the point of the future is most likely the thing we cannot imagine and least likely to be the thing we imagine. Mm. Okay, very interesting. I'm going to see if there is a line between first principles thinking and zeroth thinking, or if zeroth thinking is really first principles thinking when it yields a thing that is so radically transformative that it feels alien, mm -hmm. just to use that word. Okay, so uh, AI is going to be a zero factory. Lee Sedol, going back to the Go champion that lost to the AI, um, says playing this AI felt alien. Now, I have a feeling that what the AI was doing, and I, I have not looked at this, so if you know it better, please let me know, but I have a feeling, um, because I know how the game played out, that it, what the AI did was just something that the human mind it can't do. And it said, if I do this move, there's a 0.0012% over 50% likelihood that I will win this game. And so it just stacks moves like that, where there's just a slight yeah. advantage, slight advantage, slight yeah. advantage. And because the human mind can't daisy chain them like that, yeah. um, it goes for more blunt instruments. If I do this move, you know, my percentage of winning goes up by a, a much larger number that's easier for a human mind to track that isn't as many daisy chained items. And so again, it the the AI is is using first principles. And what makes it feel alien is that it's doing a thing that yeah, humans can't do. Exactly. Um, the invention of zero, is that something that is truly unique? I don't know. That's where my intellect begins to break down. And I can't tell, um, because if if I were to walk away from here and I had to think in a zero with way, yeah. What I would do is anchor on first principles thinking and simply remind myself that there's an answer that may be so unmoored to anything I've ever thought of before um, and hope that that remembrance yeah. allows for an intuition, and I use that word on purpose, yeah. um, to come in that I might not have otherwise had, but I wouldn't know how to force myself to invent a zero. Yeah. Yeah. It's And again, it's, uh, it's, helpful to relax the definition between zero and one mm. because if you get too firmly caught up in the zero and one it gets confusing and so yeah. there's like certain levels of obviousness and so when i went through after i sold braintree venmo i was in search for a zero i didn't know to use that name at the time and so i convened a whole bunch of dinners with my most capable friends and i would pose a thought experiment so we're in 2017 imagine we arrive at 2050 we're thriving as a species. Like we're just blown away at how marvelous existence is. What did we focus on in 2017 to make 2050 so magnificent? And then I would just intently listen to everyone's perspectives. What were they working on? What did they believe? What were their models? What were they anticipating? And I created a map of basically all the knowledge of people who I trusted and really respected. And then I said, okay, all of this is off limits. I can't do anything in this circle. What's outside the circle? What is no one focusing on? What is the zero? And that's when I tried, and I determined I'm going to solve death. Death individually, death collectively. And if you solve death, you open up opportunity 
to some infinite horizon. Because if, in, if the goal of intelligence is continued existence, all the energies we previously allocated towards death-like activities get put back into the system for expansive activities. That's when you have an explosion, a thriving of intelligence in this part of the galaxy. And so for me, it was a fun journey to go from what can I map to what doesn't exist to how to identify that and then build up the scaffolding to do it. Mm. You mentioned the galaxy a few times. Do you think that there is intelligent life? Are there aliens, Brian Johnson, outside of our galaxy? You know, it's like there's, there is an economy of podcasts that basically speculate on this answer, right? Like it's, there are thousands of people having this conversation. If I add my words to this conversation, I'm just like thousands of people. If I stop myself and say, I have no fucking idea, I'm different. And I think I actually size up appropriately my level of intelligence. Now, I know that people, when they watch these conversations, are like, God damn, that's interesting. What a fun perspective. And how amazing would it be? There's anything like, sure, like, go have your fun, do your thing. The role I'm playing in society, I'm trying to be. I'm trying my very best to be the voice of reason, of wisdom, and of insight from the 25th century. I'm not trying to play any game that's happening today. No conversation really interests me. The politics don't interest me. Current dramas don't interest me. None of it does. I want thriving of the species to unimaginable levels. That's the only thing I'm trying to do. And if I otherwise go back, you know, I, I can't distinguish my thought process from anyone else. I'm just blurred in this mesh of opinion. It's interesting. Uh, why do you prize being different so much? Throughout history, I've observed that certain people can identify impossibly hard to see things and see them through, which become normal for the future. And we live an existence that benefits from all their contributions. I see myself in a chain of people endeavoring to do that. I may fail, but I am, that's what I admire of people in the past. It's what I hope people in the, in, in the future will admire of our time. And that's the role I see myself trying to play. It's really, I mean, this is a thing I find interesting. If you're, a, if you're an intelligent, resourceful, ambitious person, and you're trying to train your attention on a given thing, what do you do? And every century has had its examples of people who go through that thought process and they say a given thing. And I'm trying to raise to our collective awareness that this is our shared moment to push aside our pettiness, our primitive dispositions, and raise our sights to understand what's right before us. It's extraordinary. And like, there's so many powers that keep us glued to this present moment, and we blind ourselves to these opportunities. But man, consciousness is extraordinary. I love to exist so much. I don't know what it's like to be dead. I can find out at some future point. Right now, the sacredness of conscious existence is something we should fight for with everything we have. And we're pretty fickle right now about that. And I think it's just a snapshot of our time and place. In the future, I think we will value consciousness with a level of sacredness and care that we can't even contemplate. It's. I think it's just, uh, I think that's, where we will be on how we understand our privilege of being on this ball floating in space as conscious beings. I so take for granted that being dead is exactly like it was before I was born. Do you have an intuition that they are different? I mean, that's zero, right? Zero is nothingness. So we were a zero, right? And the idea is you become a zero. And then at some time in between zero and zero, you're something. You said, I have no idea what it's like to be dead. 
Yeah, which is zero, a zero. But when you think about before you were alive, yeah, that, that doesn't scratch that itch for you. It's unknowable to me. On, on either side of the spectrum, it's a zero. I mean, zero is both. Zero is nothingness and zero is infinity. Zero is nothingness and zero is infinity. I don't know that I can track that. It's infinite in both, in both directions. It's just absence. I mean, you're going from zero to positive. You're going from zero to negative. Zero is on the scale of infinites, mm -hmm. infinity. Like yeah, it's in, interesting. In one direction. I, I guess what I'm getting at is you draw a distinction between the time before you were alive, which feels palpable to me in its, it feels palpable and soothing in its just absence. There just is nothing. Yeah. Uh, which look, I get, I'm not a religious person. And so uh, maybe some people find anxiety in that. The, I, I have tremendous anxiety around leaving my wife alone through death. I have tremendous anxiety around dying painfully. That does not sound fun, but I have zero anxiety about not existing, none. And the reason that I have zero anxiety about no longer existing is the just absolute sense of peace mm -hmm. I get when I think about what my life was like before I was born. Yeah. There's just nothing. Yeah. Is there a difference for you between before you were born and the thought of dying? Yeah. So, I mean, it reframed uh, a different way. So let's imagine right now I'm speaking to Tom in this exact moment in 2024. Uh, you are the authority for you. Now let's imagine in a different version of reality where baby Tom from day zero, day one, to your death, let's imagine I'm speaking to the collection of all those Toms at the same time. And I'm inquiring of your opinion, Tom. And so you just, um, just play with me in imagination that you're this emergent phenomena of all these Toms over that duration of time. So all those people's interests are represented. So it's hard for you. Let's imagine you can live to the age of 142. The technologies get good enough where you can do that. Let's now imagine that Tom at 140, and you died by an accident, not because of old age. By 142, you're actually younger than you are right now because of technologies. I love it already. So 141 Tom is now in this conversation offering his perspective about your wife, about existing, not existing, about new developments that have happened in our understanding of intelligence, of existence, etc. If you can channel that thought experiment, you can realize how narrow our contemplations are at any given moment because it we can't reach into the future and ask all the future versions of ourselves their enlightened dispositions. And we forget the previous versions of ourselves of their state of beings. And this is why it's so dangerous for us in this moment. This is like what humans have always done. But going forward, this is why it's so dangerous for us to give ourselves too much authority at any given time is we, when death is inevitable, all you have is the moment. If death is not inevitable, you have the expanse. And when you have the expanse, there's more stakeholders than just you in this moment. That already seems true to me in terms of I am trying to be kind to my future self. Uh, I don't think about my past selves a lot, but I certainly try to be kind to my future self. I try to make choices now where my knees aren't going to regret it yeah. uh, later or, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to mess myself up in a thousand ways. Um, you just brought up the expanse. So you said something really early in the conversation about you're very careful to tell people this isn't about living forever. This is about don't die. Uh, is that because people have that negative reaction to that? Mm. Because I want to talk about the expanse. Like yeah. that's the thing. So um, as somebody who just gave birth to a religion, congratulations, by the way, <laughs> uh, I think you have to you or someone in the movement has to paint a picture of what that looks like, yeah. right? So uh, yeah. you grew up Mormon and you said it was actually a wonderful childhood. Follow yeah. these rules and you get credits towards this everlasting life. And that was really awesome. That felt really good. Yeah. 
super simple to follow and you got this huge upside. Um, I think people are going to need, at least in the early days before they're really integrating with the AI and it's changing the very way they think, uh, they're going to need that vision. What does living forever, what does that expanse look like to you? Yeah. There's a, a few layers why I use the negative because a very common reaction to someone who hears don't die is they say, why the negative, right? Like, why not the positive? Like, live long, live forever, live great, whatever. Because when you make the positive statement of live long, for example, the person's going to immediately say, fuck yeah, I'm doing it. Everyone does. If you say don't die, you invite the person to collapse everything they understand about reality and have to rebuild from scratch. You, if you take the, the, the don't die admonition seriously, you have to reconstruct everything about your existence. You have to reconcile that you believe death is inevitable. You have to believe that your choice to engage in debauchery is living life. You have to, right? You, everything is about, and so people are not consciously aware of how deeply programmed death is into their existence, and therefore it sits blindly. So live long, fuck yeah, they just carry on with life and give it no thought. Don't die, they have to say, I either believe that we're heading towards a path where we may not die, or I have to say, I am going to die. You, you, But you create a fork for decision making, and it creates a real psychological and practical conundrum. Do you continue debauchery or do you say, I'm going to try this new thing? And so I love it that it, it cracks reality in a way that forces people to reconcile their existence. And number two is don't die is omnipresent practical. You and I are doing don't die right now. We breathe every few seconds. Whereas the future is so far away of you know, what is the expanse, what is this and what is that, our minds immediately discount it because we don't know if it's true, we don't know if it's going to arrive, we think it's something of sci-fi, it may be a fun imagination, but I can't act on that now. And so we do future discounting where it's like, I'm just going to have a beer and chill. And so it's not actionable, it's not omnipresent. And so you have, so don't die creates a crack where they have to reconcile existence and immediately actionable one second later for the decision they make next. Okay. But the expanse, what about okay. the expanse? So the, the expanse, um, so there's a few easy ones for us to imagine. If an algorithm has access to our body to do readouts and it has the ability to deliver, to deliver interventions and our AI is, you know, now doing scientific discovery at speeds that we haven't been able to do, it's pretty easy to imagine us stepping into a future where our body is doing repair in real time and getting access to therapies in real time that we become the improvement rate of our technology. So just like we get new releases on our, our smartphones all the time, we're getting constant updates all the time through our technology. So you can imagine something that's reasonable to say we are in near perfect health all the time. That that's just a, our systems run that way. And then you can easily take the next step and you say, well, if our bodies are maintaining themselves in near perfect health, then you could easily say, now what does enhancement look like? Yeah, buddy. Yeah. So that's very easy to do. Uh, we know where that goes. And then if you take the next step where you say, what kind of controls are we going to have on our cognition? Well, as a baseline, we have the ability to engineer atoms and molecules and organisms. Like we can design the physical and biological elements of our reality, including our conscious states. Like when we, we know when we drink alcohol or when we take a psychedelic or when we fall in love, these are biochemical states that we have. We can start constructing consciousness. And now when you pair, because it is biochemical states, and when you pair AI in doing that, where you have this real-time feedback loop, you then begin, you have this really fun question, how big is consciousness? When you say how big, what do you mean? Like right now, you know what it's like to sit down and have a conversation. You know what it's like to fall in love. You know what it's like to have a fight. You know what Do you mean how many variations are there of interpreting stimulus? Of versions, versions of reality. Like you start off as a kid, and you go through life and you have all these experiences. Right? Like yeah. the slightly different, right? Uh -huh. 
what is the what is the scale of consciousness? Like if you said you take this back in time and you ask a human, how big is reality? They can say, well, I have five senses. I can see I have surroundings around me. I can see there's like something in the sky, there's stars. Like you're trying to like size it up. And then we arrive at the modern day, we say, actually, <laughs> the microscopic is near infinite. Like when you go down to the smallest things and then you say, you go out to the edge of the universe, how big can you go out? And so you, then you create a map and say, how big and how small is reality? It's gigantic, like so big, it boggles our mind. So we've discovered through scientific the scientific process that the reality is really, really big. We haven't had the tools to play with our own consciousness. So if you were to pose the same question, like right now, I know what it's like to feel drunk and I do to be happy and sad of these certain varieties of fall in love. But how big is consciousness? Is it are we gonna have the same kind of expanse? So if our bodies are in perfect health, if we're now playing with enhancement and now we're just simply playing games of cognition, could we walk into a scenario where our minds are absolutely unimaginably different than what we have right now? Like so far removed from our current state of consciousness that we are unrecognizable creatures. I don't know why that wouldn't be possible. In the same way, like we, Homo erectus had some form of cognition. It had some similarities to us, but definitely not exactly like us and not with the expansive tools we have of what we can do today. So we've been on this evolutionary track and now we have much more powerful tools to expand our conscious states. And so in the same way, like when someone does a psychedelic, they'll report that you know they, they experienced dimensions and experiences and possibilities they never thought possible. Can I, um, so there's a quote, you actually have it in your book. I think his name is Frederick Pohl. Yeah. Uh, and he said, the job of a science fiction writer is not to predict the automobile, but instead to predict the traffic jam. Right. Let me predict a traffic jam. Tell me what you think about this. So uh, I have never thought about how big consciousness could be. That is a really interesting idea. My head goes somewhere dark immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I am really entranced by the hypothesis that we could be living in a simulation. And my the first question I had though was why would somebody simulate something that takes so much time? And then uh, the answer was, well, what if all of this, we have a perception of time that's, yeah, you know, yeah. a day is a day and we all know what that feels like. But if uh, a million years to the person watching the simulation only takes a week, yeah. now it's like you wake up every day, oh my God, look, nuclear weapons, how cool. Uh, and it becomes a very meaningful simulation for them to run if the scales of time are dramatically different. And you'll hear people talk about, I was in surgery and it felt like I was there for three years yeah. or whatever. Um, one of the most terrifying things I ever heard about the future of digital worlds is that you would have hackers that would hack somebody's mind and slow their sense of time down yeah. so that they feel like they've been trapped for a thousand years. Yeah. And you'll see that pop up every now and then yeah. in sci-fi. Uh, but that is really, really interesting. If you were going to predict a tra traffic jam, which I know you're going to be hesitant to do, because of course you can't accurately do it. I get it. I get it. Uh, but it is so interesting. Are there traffic jams that you've predicted? I think the most motivating goal we could have as a species is consciousness exploration. And the reason why I think that is most of us do that right now. We do that when we seek out novel experience. We do that when we learn new things. We do that when we have children. We're experiencing new things. We're exploring new feelings, emotions, intellect. Like we're all of us are basically experiencing the conscious mind. And some of us do it more actively than others, but that's what we're basically doing. When we watch entertainment, you know, watch new movies or or scrolling, we're trying to explore stimuli. And currently uh, that system is set up as a drug. You know, it's drugged us into this addictive closed loop thing. Um, in other things, we've imagined our greatest adventure is going to Mars. So we've been to the moon. We're saying we're going to go one step further and go to this place. Um, 
consciousness is not yet on the radar as something that we can explore with the same vigor. And so I would say the potential traffic jam is if we can sort through getting don't die as the as the guiding philosophy for the 21st century that we lock in as a species and say let's just stay alive and let's walk into this super intelligent future together because it may be pretty interesting to do and to kill each other anymore would be really primitive like that's not our thing and so then let's say that super intelligence is expanding at a certain speed and we f we bump up against some practical limitations of what our brains are capable of. So even if we do things like we're playing with the biochemicals, even if we have access to all these different molecules, like I say we're inventing brand new molecules, we're inventing brand new psychological states, we're inventing brand new appendages of the body, like we're doing all these things with enhancement, how big is that space? And so the traffic jam may be that we bump up against discovery limitations on a new place to explore that satisfies our wants. So if we say, don't die, then we're going to say, we want to play. And then we say, if we want to play, what's the, the playground look like? And the playground needs to be sufficiently interesting for us to play. Mm. Do you know um, the... Um there's a name for it, but like the fact that aliens have never come yeah. despite how big it is. Oh God, do you remember the name of that? The, the uh, dark forest? No, no, but that's also, that's very, very interesting. There, There's a name for it. The the equation as to why nobody or the oh, paradox. Is it Drake's equation? Anyway, the, um, the fact that we haven't found aliens despite the absolute yeah. just sheer yeah. massiveness of the universe. Uh, and why is that? One hypothesis that I've had about that is, and I think this is actually true, and it's interesting that you bring up exploring consciousness, is that I have a feeling it is far easier and probably ultimately more satisfying to collapse inside the mind into virtual worlds yeah. that are piped directly into our brains than it is to go yeah. out and deal with radiation yeah. and all that stuff and to have to yeah. generate enough energy to open a wormhole. Like it just seems like civilizations that get sufficiently advanced yeah. would end up looking inwards. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, like I think it's like actually tangibly representative where our brain is hidden on the other side of our eyes. Mm. And so we look forward and we see everything where we want to go. We forget what's right behind it. And so I think the, the two things I'm personally betting on that will be the exact opposite of what most people think. One is I think that the next era of exploration is not out. It's in. Mm. And number two is it's not our minds that will run reality. It's the algorithm. And our minds will, will sit in some relationship to these algorithms. Even though algorithms are running us, we may feel like it's us. We may not know the difference. Mm. And so th I, I had this experience where I was talking to this woman when I was building Kernel who had a brain implant. Uh, for her uh, her neural degenerative condition, and she had her cognitive experience before she got the implant, and the implant changed her cognition. Whoa! And she spoke about it though, that um, it was a unified thing that was her. It wasn't that the chip and the algorithm was one thing, and that she was another. She was it. She was merged with it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, me and people listening are, that sounds like the technology is so much more farther advanced than I realized. W what is the chip capable yeah, of doing Yeah, right there's, there's 300,000 people in the world who have brain implants. They've been whoa. around. Yeah. It's a, it's a thing that's been around for, uh, I think, maybe two decades. And they do what? Uh, the, most of the implants are for Parkinson's. It's, you know, people have these uncontrollable convulsions and it helps them steady state. And so it delivers the electrical stimulation. And so it brings them back to, you know, totally or semi-normal function. And so, yeah, brain implants have been going on for quite some time. And but when she says that it's changing her cognition, is it reading as uh, the tremors felt like they were outside of me, but now that I have this thing inside my brain, I feel like I'm capable of calming myself. And that's where she feels like 
it is her. Yeah, she was commenting that before she was in this uncontrolled state where her body was doing something that she didn't want it to do that made living very hard. She got this implant and it changed her body to perform as it normally would. And she didn't view that as other. She viewed that as self. And so even though there was an actual mechanical object implanted in her brain doing the simulation, it's a pretty crude technology, right? Like just doing stimulation. It's not like it's this elaborate mesh in the brain. Mm. Still for her, it was fully her conscious self existing. It wasn't like there was some other intervention by a mechanical chip doing a certain thing. And so she fully embraced the technology she became one with it and there was no change to her conscious existence. So when I talk about this thing of like blueprint running me, I actually making decisions for me on my sleep and my diet and all these things, I do the same thing. I don't see it as other. I just see it as me. And so it sounds dystopic to someone else of like, I don't want to do that. That sounds like the worst thing ever. It's a, a knee-jerk reaction that we have to new ideas. But once you experience it, it's like, oh, of course. <laughs> like, and I'm so much better because of it. And this is why I'm bullish on this situation of that we run our mouths because we're terrified of new ideas. It threatens our identities. It gives us, it creates loss aversion where we want to hold tight to our vices and how things are and we're scared. And we don't know what we're getting in exchange or it's even scary. So everything about us wants to shut it down as fast as possible. It's very human. But, you know, when you get to the other side of it, it's like, yep, <laughs> all good. <laughs> How do you keep yourself so open to new ideas? I assume that everything my mind, resp in any given prompt, anything that my mind generates is probably wrong. So I watch the first three or four thoughts land, and I'll look at them and say, that's wrong in this direction, that's wrong in that direction, it takes my mind about five or six thoughts to kind of get stabilized, and then I'll come up with something maybe interesting. But the first thought's always wrong. Same with the second, same with the third. The 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 brain just vomits in response, and it's like a knee it's like a knee jerk reaction to a to a stimuli. And so, yeah, when you say a, that something is wrong compared to what? Do you have a like? I base everything off a goal. So something is right or wrong based off I, this is my goal. Did it move me towards my goal? If yes, it's right. If no, it's wrong. Yeah. Do you have something like that that you use? Well, like the like the trolley problem. You know, the trolley problem uh, presents a quandary where there can be no correct answer in our current framework of morals and ethics. No one can make the argument that you should kill the the elder man over the mother and a child. You can't. Right. I mean, if you say we're going to sacrifice age for youth, that's just not acceptable to us. And so in that moment, um, I have to take stock that my brain <clears throat> has to wrestle with this problem for a certain duration of time, and it's going to misfire several times. And so I just know it. And it's like every time I get to a new idea, I make a rule to myself, I can't express an opinion <laughs> for at least the first few thoughts. Because once you form a conclusion you're locked in and your only incentive is to then justify why you made that observation. And so I don't feel any need whatsoever for internal consistency. If I need to contradict myself, that's great. Like I want to find where I've been wrong in previous versions of myself. And you'll see like in this conversation, the majority of the comments in, you know, in, in the section will be people's initial reaction watching this. They'll hear a first few minutes and they'll say something like, this guy's a quack, this guy's a cult leader, um, this guy is not living life, this guy, like they're, they're so predictable uh, because that's the knee-jerk reaction that a new idea landed in their inbox and their mind wanted to violently crush it and lower my status and power in the world by insulting me in the comment section. And then others want to hit the thumb up, thumb up on the content because they further want to... to uh, they want to harm me and lower my status and my ability. So the insults will be pretty vicious and they'll stack on each other. There'll be a few people who'll say, maybe, you know, like maybe this guy has something interesting to say. I agree on this. I disagree on that. Like, 
but the comment section is like 95% predictable to this kind of conversation. Mm. Uh, and just to recap, because they're afraid of new ideas, they shut it down. Like why want to lower your power in the world? Is that just humans? Yeah, because they, if, this is why I don't die. If, if don't die is possible, it invites them to reconcile their existence because everything they do right now assumes death is inevitable. Every vice they have, every life decision they've made, every thought process they have assumes life is, is, or death is inevitable. If don't die is a reality, they have to re-examine their life, and that is uncomfortable. You've got to stare down change. You've got to stare down your thought processes. You have to stare down your friends. You have to stare down everything you, you are about yourself, which I think maps to why the reaction to me has been so violent in the world over the past year. Yeah, it's is, been hysterical. It, it's totally hysterical, and it's predictable because it is so uncomfortable to grapple. So people take cheap shots at me, which again is great. Like I love it. It's fine. I'm very happy about it. It doesn't bother me one bit. It's algorithmic. So I don't blame them. They're just dealing with the brains they have. <laughs> and they're trusting that the thoughts their brains are dropping are you know, the correct assessment. Mm -hmm. And so they're just going through their own process. It's fine. But yeah, it, it really is, don't die is the most threatening thing. So it's ironic. Don't die is the most threatening thing you can say to a human in this moment. That is hilarious. Uh, one of our mutual friends wanted me to ask you, in the face of all that criticism, how does it not bother you emotionally? Oh, I love it. Not, not only does it not bother me, I have an absolute love of it. That seems impossible. Even I, and I know your punchline on this, it just seems like, do you use a, a negative response as like a uh, jujitsu move to remind yourself, oh, this is hilarious. And I'm looking at myself in the perspective of the 25th century. Or when you read the most vicious, yeah. unending wall of shit thrown at you, your actual first emotional response is, this is hilarious. I legitimately am playing for the respect of the 25th century. I'm playing for the most magnificent existence in the galaxy. These ideas are sufficiently powerful enough that ev it evokes that reaction over that kind of sustained time period. It's an absolute victory dance. It's the best thing to happen. The worst thing would be silence. No one cares. Mm. That is the absolute, that's, that's what would be dead. So that would be the most painful thing to me. Because it means no one cares. It means that the ideas are wrong. It means somehow that the ideas won't make an impact. It means that somehow this does not bridge to anyone's reality. And so this is why I've talked, you know, my, <laughs> I've had so many people approach me about the haters because it bothers them so badly. It just, it wrecks their day. It wrecks their life. They can't even look at the comment section. It just ruins them psychologically. And these are really smart, capable people that are doing things that have the power to change the world. And then they're diminished by you know, 20%, 60%, 80% because of how beaten down they feel from those they, they want their respect, but they can't get them. Mm -hmm. And it's just sad. And so I've become like this therapist of sort of walking people through of like how they can remap their disposition that if they're not getting, um, if to evaluate, are they getting enough hate? Now, you don't want to seek it out and be silly. You don't want to seek it out just to create it. You want to tune your ideas and your projects so they're sufficiently innovative that they actually move the needle forward. And hate is a wonderful indicator on the space you're creating for innovation. It's almost like you're playing on the zero to one scale. Like you want to, you want to really move that back and forth. And so you want a, an appropriate level of hate for anything you're doing. Again, like don't go out and be an asshole to create hate. Create hate with the quality of the idea. How would you feel if the 25th century clowned on you? I give it my best. Like I give it my best shot. Would that sting though? No. 
Like I am doing my very best as an intelligent being. I feel primitive. I can see my limitations in my own intelligence. I've given up my very best. And so if they clown on me, like I'm satisfied. I have genuinely given up my very best shot of everything inside of me to be useful to intelligence. To be useful for intelligence. That's interesting. Um, Talk to me about what's what's real today, what's possible today. So you founded a company called OS Fund, I think. Uh, you invested $100 million into the most cutting edge building blocks, uh, building with atoms kind of stuff. Um, how much can we engineer our reality today? Yeah, it's more, I think it's a actually a more revealing question to ask what can't we do? We're that far along. I don't have an interface with that reality. So yeah. So help me understand, cause that, I want that to be true. The sci-fi yeah. writer in me wants that to be true. Um, don't get me wrong, the modern world is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. but. Okay, so I'll give you like uh, a couple practical examples, which. Um, I'll give you an example. Okay. <laughs> so your <laughs> your ear, your left ear, yeah. uh, has you, your left ear is at the age of a 62-year-old, if I remember yeah. correctly, and you can't find a way to fix it. Yes. Yeah, that's that true. That does not seem like a reality that we can just engineer our way out of. Oh, I see. Yep. Um, I mean, if you just break it down to first principles. So you say, how are auditory signals, how do they enter the ear? How do those get converted into electrical signals that the brain then understands as sound? It's right. It's a very understandable process mechanically, biologically, like we know the mechanisms. And we know, well, we just we know exactly how it works and we know how you would need to repair it. So it's just getting to work and solving it. Now there's an there's a space where we don't know, I guess like how do you actually engineer a solution is not known. But in terms of do can we um, can we construct mechanical objects to perform the function? Yes. Can we change biology to accommodate the situation? Yes. Can we program genes to do a certain situation? Yes. Like we can do all those things. So it's just a matter of time of applying our efforts to try to solve it. But it's not like we're up against uh, the speed of light, where it's like can you travel faster than the speed of light? Physics currently doesn't have an answer for that. Mm. We have we know there's a solution in here. We can program it. We just need some time to figure it out. And this is why I'm so bullish on don't die. We're not up against the law of physics. We increasingly understand these systems of biology. We have the mechanical, physical world infrastructure and the biology to engineer these solutions. So and then you bring AI online, and now you've got more and more intelligence all the time coming to play. These are solvable things. What's the most shocking thing you've been able to repair on your body that you were just like, whoa, is it uh, folostatin? Is yeah. that is that the banger? Is it something else? Yeah. So yeah, I had my first longevity gene therapy. And what this company did, Mini Circle, is gene therapy is a thing that's going to break through the ceiling of our 120-ish lifespans. Because you can only get so far with sleep, diet, and exercise. Are you reprogramming your genes? No. So what they did is, so typically, so you can change your actual genes. Uh, you can, you know, use CRISPR or some other technology. This one, you're getting a plasmid injected as the delivery vector, and then a protein folostatin. It just sets up a shop, shop inside the nucleus, and it produces more folostatin. For people so, that don't know, myostatin gene controls the amount of muscle that you have. Uh, if you've ever seen a double-muscled cow, you can do a search for it. Uh, it's crazy bodybuilders, some percentage of them, a huge number of them are going to have myostatin deficiencies. You will starve to death if you have too much muscle on you from an evolutionary perspective and there's no Vons around the corner. Uh, so not putting on too much muscle has been an evolutionary challenge. You had to solve for it. That's the myostatin gene. Follow statin, as far as I understand it, mitigates the dampening effects of myostatin so that it's easier to put on and maintain muscle. Yes? Yes. And yeah, and a bunch of other stuff. And so what's cool a about this- A bunch of other stuff that matters or- Yeah, like the, what this company is seeing from some of the participants, it's not, these are not the study results yet, but some of the actual reports, they're seeing 
a slowing of the speed of aging. They're seeing telomerase uh, increase. They're seeing telomeres increase. They're seeing epigenetic age reduce. They're mm-hmm. seeing other other effects. So um, there's all kinds of benefits they're seeing. But the thing, like even, this therapy was great, but what I love about it is that it introduces low cost therapy, gene therapy for a whole bunch of other applications. So take out full statin and put in miles uh, or, or uh, um, clotho or put in HTERT to extend telomeres. H what? Uh, HTERT. So it's just like, uh, it's to increase. The, I heard something else. <laughs> it's to increase the telomeres, your end caps on the chromosomes. Okay. But what I like about it is it's a gene um, delivery. It's a, it, gene therapy delivery system that is safe, it has a kill switch, and it can be applied to all sorts of technologies. And so what I'd like is it introduces the idea that we can now routinely get gene therapy for a variety of things, testosterone, brain function, muscle, like you name it, we can play with it. And so Mm. once you get these platforms built, it just opens up this, this new possibility. And so what I like about the field is we're now getting to a point with these therapies where we're starting to really push up and out over and outside of diet, sleep, and exercise, or the reprogramming the Yamanaka factors. So it's getting really close. And so we haven't yet had a moment in longevity where it's like, that's it. <laughs> like We just did the impossible thing in a human, and these results are incontrovertible. And so prior to getting there, I'm suggesting that don't die – so I'm try- what I'm trying to say is we don't need to prove radical life extension before fully adopting don't die. We can do them at the same time. It's not contingent. But yeah, I mean, the, the stuff we're seeing in the field right now, even last week, there was a, a, last month, there was a paper where a company did some cell reprogramming. They took a mouse that was 124 weeks. It was going to die at 128 weeks. It extended their life by, 100, by 109%. Uh, with this, yeah, in their 124th week uh, with the cell reprogramming. So they're taking like- So wait, just, uh, maybe I'm just bad at math. So if the average human life is 84 or whatever, you're saying it lived double that? No, so just in the last, it doubled its remaining lifespan. So Got it. it. Yeah, so 124 was gonna die at 128, but extended it by 109%. Got it, got it. Because they just, for this experiment, they're just taking very end of life and saying, what can you do at very end of life of reprogramming these cells? for that specific study. What were they reprogramming the cell to do? Uh, so yeah, they, this is, um, you take cells back to iPSC. You take cells back to their uh, pluripotent state where mm-hmm. they can then differentiate into a whole bunch of different cell types. So you're, you're enabling the most interesting cellular reprogramming where you're taking it back to its more youthful state. Mm. And so the Yamanaka factors. And so I, I think we're actually in a really interesting spot that we could see some pretty big breakthroughs in the coming years that get people excited about this. Will we ever be able to make men taller? <laughs> I mean, that's like, dude, the more I get into like modern dating and stuff, it's crazy. That yeah. shit matters. Yeah, it does. She didn't, but yeah. like you just get filtered out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why we'd say no. What, uh, what would we say no to? What, what are the limitations that we can't overcome and why are the limitations? I think is the more relevant question. That though, so there's the fantasy of like, hey, AI is going to solve it all. So sure. But is there, like I did uh, an episode not too long ago. I, I was literally shocked to find out you can actually enlarge a penis. I was like, what? Like I legitimately, yeah. uh, my wife has said absolutely not, which I was very sad by. So I was like, if this shit's real, I'm going ham. What, what, what was the real- she was like, no, absolutely not. I don't, she was, she reacted so violently negative yeah, yeah. that, uh, yeah, I was saddened is the honest answer. But why, uh, why, why what, was I sad? No, no, why was she, uh, I don't know. Opposed? Well, I mean, just from the perspective of I, my penis is nothing to write home about. I'll just be very honest with you, but it fits perfectly with the person that I'm married to. And so she is not enthusiastic about more. Does she have data? Does she have, does she AB test? She has AB tested. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, yeah. I, I would, I would 
if it were possible, I would have one I could throw over my shoulder. <laughs> so uh, I'll just be very honest. That sounds awesome. But my wife is not yeah. impressed by the idea. Yeah. So, yeah. but anyway, I didn't know it was possible. I really thought that was like total BS, absolute make believe. Uh, had a urologist on the show. She's like, no, it's real. Um, did a bunch of research. Cause honestly, when I first started researching her, I was like, there's no way she's making this up. Yeah. And a bunch of people were like, yeah, it's actually real. There's studies. I read the study. Yeah. And I was like, God, I can't believe this is actually real. Yeah. Um, so that's like a today thing yeah. that I was shocked to find out. But going back to like, should men really care? That one, even though guys care a lot about it from a get a mate perspective, if you're a heterosexual, it's not just, it ranks so low on what they care about, yeah. but they, women really do care about height. Yeah. So that one seems like if there was something that we could do, yeah. you'd have a lot of people uptake. Now you can literally, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you can break the bone and yeah. it will grow back and you will get taller, yeah. but whoa, that sounds yeah. rough. Yeah, I mean, I think like getting taller sounds like a, from first glance, a much easier thing to solve than say, for example, increasing the number of neurons in your brain. Hmm. Like, you know, you got, we have very practical limitations of skull size, of neuron density, like it's, the brain's right. a much more complicated organ. So, I mean, if you, if you pose a question, what is possible, you probably could back into the constraints and then rank them, like how hard each one is to imagine being able to overcome. Not that that's a conclusive thing, but the, yeah, but getting taller doesn't seem to me like it would be among the top of the hardest thing to do. Maybe I'm Man. wrong. That is incredibly interesting. Uh, so here is a question that most of my guests can rest assured I will not ask, but tell me about your penis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the most quantified penis in the world. That is very interesting. So what are we quantifying and to what end? Can, why, why care? What What is the direction that we want to take it? Yeah, so if you... If you take to where we've been of how do you create the most extraordinary existence out, you know, possible, and you go back and back and back and back and back, it ends up with penis quantification. As one would expect. So the same thing. Yeah. So one day with the team, I said, hey, you know, we've been doing assessment of heart health, lung health, brain health. Why don't we do penis health next? And what would it take for me to have the most quantified penis in the world? And we went out and we looked at all the scientific literature. And we said, here's all the validated ways to measure a penis like to quantify a penis. And one of the things we did is we measured nighttime erections. Mm. And so that's just something that people don't realize is a thing. You, know, you As a man, you realize you have nighttime erections. As a kid, you get a lot of them. As you get older, you get fewer of them. And so I did my baseline measurement, uh, two hours and 12 minutes was my baseline, which was like roughly average for my age, 46. And then I did a few therapies, focus shockwave therapy and Botox. And my recent measurement was 179 minutes. To put that in context, the movie Titanic is just over three hours. So I'm having nighttime erections about the same duration of time as the Titanic every night. And that is better that than- That is quite the analogy or the comparison. I love it. <laughs> better than the average 18-year-old. And so mm. I reversed the functional biological age of my penis from roughly a 46-year-old to better than the average 18-year-old in six months' time. Okay. Uh all algorithm led, or this is you guys um, going rogue? Yeah, we did the same process. Measurement, scientific literature, therapy, measurement. And we just repeat again and again and again. And it probably helps, you know, of course, that my sleep is, is, is routine, that my diet is tuned in, mm. my exercise is consistent. So it probably helps that I have these other basics in place. But yeah, if nighttime erections is a significant indicator, it's a biological age predictor of cardiovascular health, psychological health, and sexual function. So it's actually a really, it's not, uh, it's not a glamour stat. It's actually a reliable health marker for men. And that's because the size of the vasculature in the penis is very small. And so if you have a problem there, it's a very early indicator that you're going to start having problems in the bigger veins down the road. Uh, so what are the things that you do that help? Yeah, I mean, so for example, the reason why, so as evidence of it being a function of health or of well-being, be sleep deprived for one night or even a few nights, nighttime erections vanish. Is that from a, there's something going wrong with your vasculature or the brain is just like, we don't have time to play with that. 
I just have to deal yeah. with everything yeah, else. The body, yeah, the body is prioritizing other essential functions. Huh. And so, yeah, it, it evaporates almost instantaneously when the basics are not in place. And so you really need to be in top tier health. Uh, so it's a good, yeah, it's a, like a weather gauge for how you're doing with your health. And then overall for your other sexual functions, psychological mm-hmm. function. And so what was your question? What do you do to improve it? Oh, um, we did two therapies. So we did focus shockwave, which is a wand that you put on the penis. It can be used for the entire body. So when people have tear an ACL, they're doing rehabilitation, you can uh, use focus shockwave. It improves healing processes. So you can use it anywhere in the By body. By creating micro damage. Basically, yeah. Okay. So you can do it in Painful, the penis. Painful, pain management. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Pain management. People do it for pain management. And so mm-hmm. you put it on the penis, it's, you can do it on the shaft and the tip. So you, it's, it's pretty painful. I mean, you, you, and there's different levels of power. You can go low or go high and it's especially painful on the tip. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds less fun. We have people off camera, even uh, (laughs) chuckling on that one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you've talked about, uh, one of the things you have to think about as you get older is you begin losing sensation that includes in the penis. Um, Regardless of body part, what do you do to try to get that sensitivity back? Is it blast it with shock waves? I mean, that seems a little counterintuitive. Yeah. So um, I don't know the answer on this one. I've been measuring nerve sensitivity on my body for the past couple of years and specifically my hill. So we do this test where I'm I'm laying down, I can't see anything. And then there's a contraption where you're measuring, you have two points and you increase in distance until you get to a point where I can't, I'm sorry, you start you start wide and you narrow, and then you get to a point where I can't distinguish that it's two points and not one. So mm. it's two, one, two, one, and so I'm seeing if I can discern. So I've been measuring my nerve sensitivity to see if I can distinguish between two points on my hill, and the same thing is true with the penis. So you can basically do the same nerve sensitivity test doing that, and as you age, you become less sensitive. You lose your feelings. Like on an 80-year-old, I think the data was something like they can only distinguish between two and one points at something like two or three centimeters. It's a pretty big difference. I didn't realize how much uh, loss they would have at that age. Mm. But yeah, so that was a new measurement for me. So same thing on the tip of the penis. So your sexual satisfaction over time diminishes because your sensitivity also goes down. Okay, all the things you do, um, there is a lot of self-denial there is a lot of i mean getting your penis shock waved uh it's not fun like there's a lot of pain management there's um to be measured as frequently as you are constantly drawing blood i mean it's just a lot a lot a lot uh the idea of handing over my life choices to an algorithm the one thing this all comes down to for me is i assume you're optimizing for a good life but then the question becomes, what is a good life? Yeah. And can you, are you living it now? Can you program that into AI so that the AI actually knows based on the data it can collect, I actually am steering you to yeah. the good life? Yeah. If you pose the question, what is a good life throughout all of time? And let's just say you take data points for every year for the past 2,024 years, you'll get an answer that's different. I mean, that will change over time. And every, in the year, for example, 37 AD or the year 1037 AD, you'll get a different answer on what a good life means. And in any situation, their response is not truth. It's a mirror to their time and place. And so there is no such thing as a good life. It's just simply a phenomena that emerges in time and place with a given culture. And when death is inevitable, you play a good life game because we're all going to die. When death becomes potentially not inevitable, it becomes a different thing. And so I'm not playing the 2024 version of a good life. I'm playing for the infinite horizon. And this is why everyone dings me because they say, this guy has, has not conformed to the norms of the 2024 good life, which include, you know, the following things. Mm. And that's why they they want to dunk on me and they want to minimize me because they want to they want their version of a good life to be superior to the game I'm playing, which is the infinite horizon. And so it's just different. We just see the reality different differently. 
Okay, I imagine though, you're just trying to get past this moment. Would you want to play the the don't die game forever? Or are you, do you believe that don't die gets you to, and now the good life begins? Yeah, so this is the thing is like we, we may lock in as a species on don't die in a shockingly short period of time. Like this could be, I introduced the concept of don't die in November of or December of 2023. It's only three or four months old. And if you look at history over time of when ideas were introduced, when they were adopted into some kind of mainstream, and then they became continuous, typically hundreds of years for them to kind of find their way through society. This idea could find its way to be the guiding philosophy of the species in a matter of a decade or shorter. And this is because... AI is going to create existential crisis. It's going to call into question everything we understand about reality. It's going to open up this, the op- create an opening where something's going to jump in for a new thing. And I'm playing for when crisis happens, for don't die to drop in, that we played as a species. And so could it happen in a year or three years or five years? Yes. And if we lock in on don't die and we say, like, oh, my God, that's insane. We were talking about this the other day like it was impossible and it's just here and it's omnipresent. And let's just say we lock in as a species and we're playing that and we get really good at it in a couple, a couple of years. And then seven years from now, we're off to a different reality. Like who knows what the game is? Like don't die is just now part of the fabric of existence like zero is. We don't even think about it. Like no one's committing self-harm. No one's harming each other. We have a sacredness for conscious existence we've never had before. And now we're off playing brand new games of how big is consciousness? That's where that's where the brightest minds are is what are the boundary conditions for consciousness and how do we punch through those limitations? Mm. Religions need uh, rituals. They need things that bond people together. They need um, movements that you share, things that really make you feel like a tribe. You guys don't have, a, unless you're pointing to AI like a deity, which maybe you are, um, you don't have the obvious things that Catholicism, you know, had hundreds of years mm-hmm. to cobble together. And um, how are you going to make this sticky? Oh, we do. Yeah. So I, I'm working right now on trying to build a don't die nation state. So if you if you take this don't die idea seriously. Yes. <laughs> then you say, okay, I'm in. What do I do now? No government in the world is helping its citizens not die. And so a government, a nation state, needs to actually perform the basic functions, including testing and medical services and therapies and you know, access to all kinds of things you can't get. And so I want to build, it'd be amazing if I could do something like a 20 million person don't die nation state in less than a year where you have 20 million people locked in as citizens and they say, we don't want to die, but to do that, we need to, we need proper sleep. We need exercise. We need blood draws. We need medical care. And so I want to provide the basic infrastructure for people to take care of themselves in ways that their governments don't allow currently. Okay. Uh, That is a massive can of worms. So let's dive right in. Are you doing a nation state or are you doing a network state a la Balaji Srinivasan? Yes, both. So I mean, I, I use nation state. So yes, network network state. I say nation state because it's a more understandable word. And yeah, but it also comes with like, if, if you're really trying to build a nation state, my next question is geography. Are you taxing? Uh, what are you doing to fight off the nations that are going to crush you for trying to start a nation? Yeah. Network state, uh, for people that don't know Balaji, uh, he's been a guest on the show. I highly encourage you to watch that episode. But he he believes that now and even more so into the future, that people will be non-geographically tied yes. through basically a belief system. They'll use cryptocurrency as like the, the way that they interact on financial rails. Uh, and that even though they're distributed all over the world, they will have a unifying identity, code of ethics, so on and so forth. Um, Okay, so nation state, you say, just so people sort of yeah. get what you're talking about, but you really mean network state. Yeah, and Balaji is a friend. Yes, I'm, I listened I'm, to your episode. I didn't know how well you knew each other, but- Yeah, yeah, and we're working together on this. 
Okay. So, yeah, we this all as soon as you said yeah, niche, I was yeah. like, okay, wait, that biology episode yeah, we, makes a lot more sense now. We we see the world in very similar ways, mm-hmm. and we both see the new trinity being um, AI on chain and don't die. Like that. That's the structure that builds society. On chain, you get the computational scaffolding of systematic build. Don't die gives you the directional attention of what you're actually playing. And AI is the intelligence fuel in the system. Hmm. That's the new structure of reality. And so the chain gives you a reliable foundation to build methodically and mathematically and allows you to imagine a situation where you have goal alignment that is computationally aligned. Right? Like right now, we willy-nilly decide what we're going to do and say to someone else. It's, a, it's like a pretty random process in our brains and our behaviors. When you have this mesh, uh, it's a different game. And so, yeah, it's basically a network state. And we can walk into this to say we share these things together in common of these basic uh, health practices. And then you walk up to increasingly more sophisticated things as a network state. So uh, initially, no geography, but there's no reason why we couldn't spin up geography and multiple regions. There's no reason why we couldn't be negotiating with other uh, governments to do various things. So it's just a baby step, but it's, it's, a, it's a tangible step to say, if we contemplate Don't Die as a philosophical exercise, which is fun, the next step is, what time am I going to bed this evening? And what am I going to have for breakfast? And how do I address some kind of medical problem I have? As you just need to be extremely practical. You know, like religion has not served the purpose of solving practical problems. Religion solves a problem of soothing you that your practical problems are insignificant in the larger scale of things. False. Okay. Uh, Don't eat pork. Why? Trichinosis. There are reasons why... um, so if you can buy into the idea that traditions are experiments that worked, religion is the, the medium by which the meme spreads. So you need a way, and look, maybe it's not serving us in a modern context, and I am not religious, but I get why they have worked for thousands of years, and I get why there is a new movement that I see coming um, that I'm calling the tradicalization of people, where people are going to try to go backwards. They're going to try to reintroduce religion sure. as a thing that people ought yeah. to embrace. Yeah. And I understand what they're trying to address, which is, you know, just to channel a little Nietzsche, uh, God will die, we will have killed him, and there will be so much blood on our hands, we will never be able to wash it away. Meaning that it it does damage when people no longer have that the medium by which the meme can spread. So it isn't like the only way that you can be moral is to believe in religion. And this is one thing I meant to bring up earlier and didn't get a chance. Um, all of the things that you're saying presume that people have your level of intellect. You're north of 130 for sure. You might be north of 150. Uh, dude, most people just can't hang. Like they need that propagation medium of religion for them to orient to the world to know, oh, I don't do this thing because God told me not to. Like they need right, that. Right. Um, religion, as far as I can tell, is the only thing that works for hyper intelligent people and for people that are um, that struggle. And and I don't even want to be derogatory. There before the grace of God go I. Um, so that that to me, like religion, certainly was for a very long time, hyper-practical, but for the same reasons that I'm paranoid about AI, I'm paranoid about religions, they kill a lot of people, but they do like a thing. Like they have a, they they have existed, you even said that they tend to outlast nation states for a reason. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, it's like, um, it's one of, it's one of, if not the most ambitious thing that anybody could have done in the first few centuries, the past few centuries. To start a religion. Yeah, oh yeah. It's interesting you anchor that around ambition. For me, the the more interesting thing about religion is just how it galvanizes gigantic groups of people yeah. and will give them a fervor 
that can be amazing or terrifying. Yeah, I mean, this is, so we're saying the same thing. So uh, what I'm saying is if you, if you look at uh, intelligence on this earth, and let's just say you're doing some form of calculation of like what, what's the impact of influence on all intelligence on this earth. And you're looking at uh, influence in the way of like where the species moved, what it did, how it thought, whether it progressed or not. In that larger contemplation, religion is one of the most influential things on the body of intelligence on planet Earth. Because it, it, it feeds into state, it feeds into culture, it feeds into invention, it feeds into everything. Mm. And so country companies come and go, you know, individuals come and go, uh, but religion has this staying power, which is unique. And so if you're, if you're someone who's playing the biggest game of ambition to say, how do you move this body of intelligence on this planet? You, you wouldn't rule out religion as a mechanism of doing it. Mm. Right? You would actually say that actually is probably the most powerful technology ever created by humans until the arrival of AI. And so now we have this new point in time where you're saying if you're ambitious and you're playing with the body of intelligence on planet Earth, what do you do? And so a lot of people look at Don't Die and they immediately want to tag it as a cult and they want to say it in a in a demeaning way. And right. they want to call it a religion in a demeaning way. I don't say it's a religion. I don't say it's not a religion. I'm saying it's something practical. And wherever you want to take it with your definition of whether you want to be demeaning or supportive, I don't care. Like it's whatever you interpret it to be. Mm. I'm talking about it from something extremely practical that informs what I eat for breakfast, how I understand ideas, how AI engineers engineer intelligence. It's full stack. And so my comment to you was religions have not tried to practically solve death. It was never in their power to do so. The technology has never been present. They've been trying to soothe the reality that death is inevitable. It's interesting. That is a very valid interpretation. I get why you're saying that. But in some ways, if they believe the book, the religion at a at a um, organism level, if you think of the, all of the people in the religion, all the people that contributed to the books, all that, if you think of that as an organism, the organism has tried to solve for death by telling you that if you believe when you die, sure. you will live on. Sure. Now, I think you and I both think that that is just inaccurate factually, but I mean, that really pretty impressive when you think about I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I um, let's say that something happens to someone I love. I don't believe in God, and I wish I did because I want to mm -hmm. pray. I mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. there to be someone yeah. I can appeal to right, that right, will help right, me in that situation. Right, you know, right, right. it's like such a powerful impulse. And so, if you're about to die, or someone you love yeah. is about to die, that yeah. impulse is so strong yeah. that it it is a while. Yes, it's soothing. Um, it's soothing by creating a place in consciousness, going yeah. back to your earlier thing, that exists and is real and yeah. that you maybe can't access it the way you want. Um, but it's pretty interesting. I remember because I used to believe when I was a kid and when my grandmother died, I really had this profound sense of she's watching you. And it got weird when I wanted to masturbate, but it was cool <laughs> to know that grandma was yeah. alive. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a trip. Yeah. The way that it works on our minds. Let me ask. So how do you think governments are going to respond to network states? It's, I mean, you could model it out and I can't imagine it wouldn't be predictable. Yeah. It doesn't, I'm worried on chain worries me. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, so your content, your, your question is how are existing power structures going to uh, goal align, or how are they going to reconcile with new power uh, conflicts? Yeah, I think governments are yeah. going to get upended. Well, yeah, and they're going to freak out. Sure. Yeah, and, and freak out means shoot people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that's what humans do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is again why don't die is so important is because 
the, you know, if you, again, zoom out to say, what are the patterns at play? There's so few surprises in our reality. We humans are so predictable in our thoughts, in our responses, in our behaviors. We are individually, we are collectively. It's, it's like we, we think we're living this novel experience. We're not. We're patterns and we're repeatable patterns. So you just take, you zoom out far enough and you see the patterns. It's not novel. So of course that's what's going to happen. And so that's what I'm saying is like you, it doesn't take a lot of creativity to imagine how we as a species are going to play out with increasingly more powerful weapons at our disposal or our, our willingness to commit self-destructive harm and ruin our planet. It's not like we can't stop our vice. We can't take corrective actions. We can't save ourselves from death. It is a limitation of our intelligence. And if we're sober enough, we can acknowledge that. And so something has to change if we're going to stop ourselves from annihilation. Now, like, you can take a different approach and say, be optimistic. Like we as a species, we've always done it before. We're going to do it again. Like, okay, like I'm open to that. But the probabilities to me, like the, the situation we're in with, with climate change, like we're, we may already be past a point of no return. We don't know. We cannot model these weather systems with a whole lot of accuracy. Not, you know, like we have been repeatedly surprised over the past few years at how fast and how significant the changes have been. We don't know. Like this idea is like if we can turn things around before 2030, we may be okay. We don't know. And so as a species, if we were actually intelligent, we would stop everything we're doing and say, first job is take care of our planet. If we don't have an inhabitable home, we're all dead. But we don't. We prioritize making money and economic interest above all things. So as a species, we're extremely foolish. And we just we need to reconcile with that and just accept it for what it is and then address the problem because we're not going to change. Until AI arrives. Brian Johnson, man, has this been interesting. Where can people follow you? I hang out on all the social channels. I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. I love hit, hit me up. Yeah. There it is. All right, everybody. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out this other conversation with Peter Diamandis. The bowhead whale, the largest mammal, can live 200 years. Uh, Greenland shark can live 500 years and have pups at 200 years old. And the question is, if they can live that long, why can't we?